committee meeting on Wednesday the 29th of July. This is a virtual meeting and I will just read through the list of committee members and if they could just say present to confirm that they're present. So Georgina Hill, I'm chair, I'm present. Mark Swinburne, if you could present. unmute. Gordon Castle, I believe is an apologies. Lynn Grimshaw. Lynn, can you unmute and say you're present? I believe okay. Lynn's away from her computer at the moment. To okay. wish to Mark come back to her at the end. Hello, Lynn, Confirm you're present. I'm present. Leslie Rickaby. Present. Ian Swetherbank. Present. David Towns. Here, yeah, Miss. Peter Topping. Present. And Stephen Watson. Present. Great. Thank you very much. So the first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. Kay? Yes, we have apologies from Councillor Castle. Councillor Castle, okay. And I think that's everyone else present. Item number two, the minutes of the meeting of the last audit committee that was held on the 27th of May. Just give everyone an opportunity to open that uh, file or hard copy, which you should have. Is everyone content that we accept this is a true record of that meeting? Agreed. Great. 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 Can I just say, I just say excuse me, this chair has been disconnected. Connected. 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 I can see that chair has returned to the meeting, Councillor Hill. Councillor Hill, I can see that you returned to the meeting um, without the camera at the moment and you're on mute. I'm sure. Shall I just pick up until Georgie gets back uh, connected properly? I think that sounds like the best option. Thank you, Councillor Swinburne. Great. Okay, then. So we've done uh, item two, the minutes. Item three, disclosure of members' interest. Do we have any disclosures that we need to pick up on, please? No. Okay, thank you. So item four, reports of the external auditor. So it's 4A, audit strategy memorandum, uh, Northumberland County Council and Group Year ended on 31st of March, 2020, Appendix A. So who's picking up on that one, please? Here, it's Cameron Waddleyer from Azar. I think it'll probably Hi, be Cameron. Picks on this one. Thank you. Um, could I... Um, just ask a quick question of the chair, which is, or others, do you want to ask questions as I go along? 
or would you prefer me to go through the whole report and then leave questions till the end? I think it would probably be easier if you go through the report and we'll pick up questions at the end, please, Cameron. I'll do that. Okay. So this is our plan for the audit of the accounts and VFM for the year ended 31st March 2020. It's obviously a little bit later than we would have hoped to have got it uh, to the committee just because of the pandemic. Um, it is worth just pointing out there are still bits and pieces of our initial planning and that we've not managed to complete yet, but that's solely to do with the pandemic impact. And we have now got a response from your predecessor auditor around about access to files as well. So if you look at the covering letter to the report, one of the things we said we haven't done yet is review those files. We still haven't reviewed those, but we're now making arrangements with EY to access those files remotely so we can carry out that work. And from an efficiency point of view, that is by far the best way to get assurance of the opening balances. So in terms of the audit itself, uh, the scope of the audit hasn't changed since last year. Uh, we still have to audit the accounts of the council and the group. We have to give a VFM conclusion. We have to report to the National Audit Office around about the consolidation process. And also we have to take on board any issues raised by electors or, or others who are allowed to ask questions. To date, we've had no questions from electors uh, nor any correspondence from members of the public for the committee's information. In terms of the report, I'm not going to go through in detail every single area of the report, um, but there's a few things I will draw out and then open up to questions if that's OK. So the first thing you'll see is that from a group audit point of view, um, Mazar have also now been appointed by Advanced Group. Um, from an independence point of view, we have appointed a different partner to lead that audit uh, because we think that's quite good because I'm the audit of the pair, council and audit of the group. So that person provides assurance to, to Jim and I via that process. And there are a number of areas within Advance um, accounts that become material in the councils. So we audit those figures and particularly separately and get that assurance from their audit. In terms of um, significant risks, these are the areas that we feel are higher risk in terms of our audit opinion. So it doesn't really relate to the business risk or the risk management process of the council. Um, so the first of those is uh, management override of control. Um, that is a risk that applies to all sectors, all audits and across the globe effectively. We must always consider that significant risk and do the work associated. Our focus therefore is around about um, something called journals, which is a way that the officers put manual amendments into the accounts, not gen generated automatically by the ledger. Uh, we look at anything that looks like an unusual transaction outside what we'd expect the council to be engaged in. And we focus our attention around about some of the estimates and judgments in the accounts, mainly because those aren't matters of fact. Um, we also um, do not rebut fully the revenue recognition risk and this effectively is making sure the councils recognise the income in its accounts in the correct year, both in, at the group and council level. So again, our main focus is on the more variable um, areas of income, so not so much on council tax and business rates, but very much to do with fees, charges and other income. And where necessary, we'll also obtain direct confirmation of things like bank balances, etc. People have been looking at the press recently, you'll have seen some of the issues around about a failure to obtain bank letters and the potential impact that has on external audit. Um, another big risk for a number of different reasons is around about the pensions figures in your accounts. And that is because they're incredibly complex, they're based on a series of assumptions and judgments by the actuary, and uh, there are certain aspects of that make it slightly riskier this year, well, actually quite a lot riskier this year. One is, this is the year of the triennial valuation. So you'll be aware that the pension fund is revalued basically by the actuary once every three years. This is the first year of account where those actually come in. The second point is that due to the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a lot of uncertainty in the markets around about the year end. And as a result, um, quite a lot of fluctuation in asset values in particular. So clearly that then has an impact in terms of the pension fund, which has a knock on impact on Northumberland County Council. So again, um, an area of considerable time and effort on the part of officers and auditors in getting that assurance. And that assurance partly will come from EY, uh, so, sorry, not this year, that's next year. The assurance will also come from our audit the pension fund, which the plan's next in the agenda. Um, 
we auditors have got a bit of an unhappy habit at the moment of calling um, property plant and equipment PPE. So I'm going to really try and avoid that because it's an entirely different meaning these days. Um, but fundamentally, what we're looking at here is the valuation of the council's land and buildings and investment property, both within the council and the group. Again, there's a degree of uncertainty involved in that because it's a matter of judgment by a valuer a lot of the time. And again, COVID-19 has had an impact on that because of the availability of comparable information around about indices, et cetera, at the year end. So again, quite a key area of focus for us because there's some big numbers in your accounts in relation to that area. Um, risk five, which is around about the valuation of short and long-term debtors. Uh, in a normal year, we wouldn't have this as significant risk. We'd have it as a standard risk, so we'd still test it. But because of COVID-19, there's a potential risk around about the impairment of values of debt owed to the council. Um, so as a result of that, we feel it's significant risk and we will do some more work than we traditionally would do. Normally, it'll be higher sampling, more challenge to the council officers around about the value, any bad debt provision to use old terminology, etc. And finally, we also have got the Newcastle Airport valuation in. Now, it's, it's, it hovers around about the materiality number, which is why it's not a significant risk. But there is still a judgment involved in the valuation of the airport at the year end because of, again, the pandemic impact. And that's something we have recognised a risk uh, across the board for our clients that are obviously involved in LA7. And we're aware that quite a bit of work has been done at South Tyneside Council around about the valuation and potential impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on those values. In terms of value for money, um, there are uh, two uh, risks recognised in our plan as it stands at the moment. The first is a risk in relation to um, sustainable resource deployment, in other words, medium term financial plans. Um, we have that in most places because it's unusual that there isn't um, a degree of uncertainty about local government finance and pressure on those finances for various reasons. Uh, we don't feel that Northumberland's any different in that regard. So therefore our focus here is around about looking at how the council performed last, last year, so the year of the count. Also looking at the savings plans, the MTFS, some of the assumptions in the MTFS, and looking at the effectiveness of things like budget monitoring and that medium term financial planning process. The second risk we have to recognise because uh, last year uh, the council was issued with an adverse VFM conclusion by the predecessor auditor. As a result of that, we are required to follow up the issues raised by the predecessor auditor. And you'll see from the report on page 14 um, exactly what we're going to do to do that. We've already done a fair bit of work in that area with officers to date. The next bit of the report covers the fees, and those are um, what we agreed with the council um, earlier this year, which were then went through a process with Public Sector Audit Appointments Limited um, to ratify those and discuss those with the council. Uh, and you'll see that we have put that in. There is a possibility of additional fee because of the COVID-19 impact this year, um, but clearly it's very difficult to judge what that may be at this stage. We actually have to do the work first and then actually look at that. Uh, but rest assured, we will be communicating that as timely basis as possible, Chair, with both officers and councillors and independent members of the audit committee. And if that's outside of the committee process, that's the way we'll do it by letter. Um, the council has also engaged us to do some non-audit services. Uh, the committee might be aware that there was a new ethical standard for auditors published earlier this year. Um, as a result of that, um, there are a lot more um, checks and balances around about what auditors can and can't do. Uh, the three areas that we are doing are all uh, essentially grant claims required by central government. Uh, that's explicitly covered in different sections of the ethical standard, and it is OK for us to do that work. However, we must report that to the audit committee, and the audit committee needs to formally approve the appointment of Mazar to do that work. Um, so that would be something we'd be looking for um, to be minuted clearly. So there's actually an audit trail, uh, no pun intended. From an independence point of view, Chair, um, you'll see in the report we do discuss independence. The three areas we highlight are to do with that grants work I've just mentioned. And in there, we just highlight some of the safeguards and some commentary around about the nature of the work and why we actually don't think there is a safeguard required. 
because essentially they're required by central government. Section eight covers our approach to materiality, uh, which is um, it's quite similar to the predecessor auditor's approach. In practical terms, there's, there's quite a lot of um, similarity across audit suppliers in terms of public sector. And you'll see that we basically use the threshold of expenditure. So in other words, what the council spends, we think that is the most appropriate way to set materiality for the council. And we set that in a range between one and 2% essentially. Uh, and it's it's broadly similar to, uh, I think the EY's approach last year, and I think numbers are very similar too. We also set performance materiality, that's the level we test. The reason for doing that is so there's a bit of headroom between the two, just to make sure that uh, everything we do test, there's no potential scope for something to be above that headline materiality number. Um, auditors didn't used to communicate that to, um, to our clients because we didn't want them um, looking at it and thinking we can get away with something just below that. Uh, but in practical terms, uh, we're going to be looking at it anyway. So we would find it and we're pretty confident just to, due to the testing approach that we adopt. Uh, trivial is something um, a number of uh, clients often ask us about. The terminology comes from the auditing standards. Um, trivial is a level below which we wouldn't necessarily report an error to the audit committee. We would nevertheless report that through to Christney's team within finance, to allow them scope to amend the accounts. Uh, and generally speaking, that's clearly um, something that some places do and some don't. And I think to some extent it depends on the nature of the issue, its importance, and also the time available to make those amendments. But clearly that's a judgment for the um, finance team and also the audit committee as well. But we feel our approach is consistent with all our other clients in public sector, and we think that's reasonable in terms of the standards as well. There are, because we're external auditors, um, some other areas where we um, think that using that big number for materiality wouldn't be appropriate. Most notably, that relates to things like members' allowances, because we think there's a public interest in those numbers, and also officers' remuneration, and anything to do with things like exit packages, etc. for exactly the same reason. Not because we think they'd be wrong, merely because there's a public interest. If we didn't audit those because our materiality was 14 million, we think that would be um, inappropriate based on the auditing standards. And partly because that's quite often the main area of uh, the accounts that the public are interested in, perhaps understandably. Um, appendix A isn't a very exciting appendix, I'm afraid, but it does tell you what we have to report at different times. And you'll see from the ticks on page 20 of the report that the audit strategy memorandum, so this plan just now, actually ticks off around about eight of those different areas. Uh, the rest of those, generally speaking, will be either uh, repeated when we got to do the audit completion report at the end of the audit, or they'll be covering those things that we've not yet covered because we haven't done the work. Appendix B is just highlighting a fairly major change that's been put off by a year because of the pandemic, which is the change to IFRS 16 around about leasing. Uh, which does have quite significant uh, implications for anybody that has a reasonably large lease portfolio. Um, the council's aware of that as our officers, and we are aware that preparations have been underway on that area for some time, and something clearly we, we will revisit uh, next year. Though we are waiting, and the council is waiting for a little bit more guidance from SIPFA about some slightly odd areas that local government has in its accounts that don't really compare to the corporate world, uh, which therefore requires some nuanced thinking around about their standard setters. I'm finished this plan, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions from um, the committee members. Stop muting myself. Thank you. Sorry about that. And thanks, Mark, for taking over. Um, that I picked up most of that. Um, and that seems a very fulsome, thorough report. Um, can I... Could somebody put the hand up if they would like to ask a question? Has anyone got any questions on that? Stephen? Uh, Steve, Stephen Watson. Hi. Th thank you for that, Cameron. It's a, it's, a, it's a very thorough report. I just want to pick up on something you said right at the start, and that is the cooperation you've had from Ernst & Young, or EY as they call themselves these days. Do you feel you've had a full disclosure of all the information that you need uh, to, to uh, as an input into this um, strategy for a plan 
Um, I noticed you did mention that um, some uh, working papers, et cetera, were still, you were still waiting for them. Uh, do you feel you've had full disclosure and enough to actually feed into this plan? Um, we have no reason to doubt that we will get that disclosure, um, Stephen. It's just a, a simple matter of when the pandemic hit. So if you remember, we were appointed, I think, late January. We commenced the discussions with um, the council officers around in, in sort of February time, really. And that's where we started the planning process. Uh, we had literally, I think, written to UI to ask for access, etc., when lockdown happened. Um, so it's a simple matter of they, they weren't in their offices, we weren't in theirs, therefore it was impossible to actually access files. Um, we did chase them a couple of uh, weeks ago and ask them whether things have changed. What they've confirmed is they're happy to have a call with us now around about making arrangements and they will make their files available to us remotely in due course. And that's basically what we would expect as part of that handover process. So I would say we have had cooperation from EY to date. And the only reason we've not got as far forward as we would have liked is solely to do with COVID-19 and the impact that's had in terms of government guidance. Okay, so the, the, the bits that we're missing, just to pick up on that, the bits that we're missing in terms of the disclosure to date, which obviously we understand because of the pandemic were difficult, you don't feel that they would have a material impact into it, to this plan particularly? In other words, there isn't anything there that you think might be a deal breaker that might come forward, that might change this plan? I'd, I would I would be surprised, Chair, on the basis that um, we obviously have access to their completion report from last year that the committee got around about, I think it was late November time. And in that, that highlights all of the reporting issues they felt they had to raise with the Council. So from that point of view, uh, there wasn't a lot raised in relation to the accounts, either for the Council group or the pension fund. There were some issues, but nothing, nothing that felt particularly major to us. The key issues they raised clearly were around about value for money uh, and we've already covered that off in terms of following up those points in the plan so um, beyond that it'd be very difficult until we've had that conversation with the partner uh, the manager and actually reviewed the files to see if there was anything else but um, from experience of hand taking over files from other firms i'd be very surprised if we found something that was out of sync with what we expected okay <laughs> Um, it seems like Georgine has dropped off. So, uh, Peter, if you want to ask your question, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, Stephen actually covered because I was I had some concerns about the, you know, whether there were going to be any issues with the, the handover from from EY. The other question I had, Cameron, was. Um, on page 14, when you're talking about the VFM conclusion from last year, and one, of the, one of the areas you're going to focus on is the management of wholly owned subsidiary companies. And I'm assuming that's a focus on Advance Northumberland. Are you the auditors for that entity or is, do you have to deal with another uh, auditor? as it were. Do you see what I mean? Yes, completely. Um, we are, we have been appointed, I think a couple of months ago now, to advance Northumberland Group. So Mazar is the external auditor, so that definitely does facilitate that process. I think I mentioned when I was going through the report that I'm not the partner responsible for that audit because um, we generally find it's better to have some degree of separation. So um, it's a guy called Craig Maxwell that's a partner for that audit. He's been liaising with Advanced Northumberland Group. Uh, what we do is the audit team for the group is we issue um, fairly simple group instructions to him that require him to do certain things in relation to the audit of Advanced Northumberland Group. Traditionally, we wouldn't necessarily cover VFM, but some of our team will do some of that work. Um, so we will be aware of whether or not there's any issues. Uh, one thing I did uh, did occur to me when we were looking through some of the reporting points from EY, some of them are, are probably a point in time reporting points because um, things have clearly moved on. So some of that consideration will be looking at how things, I guess, have developed over the last 12 months plus since the 31st March 2019 year end, which is clearly relevant. Um, so that, that has been a lot of the focus of the work we've done today around about VFM, looking at the reporting points understanding the council's response to those points, um, unpicking some of that and actually looking to see what progress has been made 
since the last time round. Uh, and that's where we'll get to when we come to report this year. Thank but you. Clearly, but, but clearly, we still have to have that conversation with EY, uh, which we're, we're busy planning just now to take place over the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Stephen and, and Peter. Is there anyone else who has any more questions? Um, no, thank you for that, Cameron. And um, just before we move on to the next one, and no doubt it, it will appear in the next one as well, uh, as you mentioned, these reports are no, no doubt affected and shown so because of the, the COVID situation. Um, and reflecting quite a significant change um, and the results that will come as we'll see played out in future reports have been affected significantly because of the situation that we've been in and the pandemic um, and the reports look considerably different to what they normally would because of that situation um, and I would imagine that writing the reports as a result of that um, has been more difficult because it's a bit of an unknown entity as to how things are going to be played out in the future. Um, so that's probably been more difficult for you to, to, to write these reports. But if you want to move on to the um, the next one, item B, please. I will do, Chair. I'll just very quickly respond to that point. I think um, if, if it reassures the committee any, um, certainly it's taken a lot of time thinking about what the additional risks related to the COVID-19 pandemic could be. But clearly the National Audit Office exists as well. There is an audit suppliers group and we sit as part of that group and, and we all talk to each other around about the sort of impact that might have. To make sure A, there's a bit of consistency across the sector and B, just a bit of constructive challenge amongst the suppliers to make sure that if, if one firm's saying, well, we think this is a risk, um, we're not sitting there going, well, that's, that's, that's not a risk because what we should be doing is saying, well, actually, could it be a risk? Um, the outcomes in this report and reflect those deliberations, if that makes sense, at that level, not just what I think. Yeah. yeah if that's, that's provides good, reassurance. Good to hear. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of pension fund, the, the broad, um, broad outline and um, sort of format layout of the report is very similar. Um, we haven't covered up front around about the COVID-19 impact. But I think we issued this just slightly beforehand and I, and I tweaked a template for the second one to reflect that. But clearly some of those issues also apply. Uh, the key thing for us about the pension fund is trying to get the audit done as fast as we possibly can, uh, because the committee will be aware that um, essentially it merged with Tiny Weir Pension Fund on the 1st of April 2020. Uh, and therefore that has some implications. So we've agreed with um, Chris, Allison and the team that we will um, crack on with that one as fast as we possibly can. So it's worth bearing in mind that context, if that's okay, Chair. So in terms of um, some slight differences, I guess, um, clearly the pension fund is a very different beast to the council audit. Uh, there are different risks in there. There is a degree of complexity around about asset values in particular that we have to consider. Um, the fund obviously uses investment uh, managers, uh, custodians, etc. So we consider that. Um, that also involves a degree of complexity in terms of getting that assurance. Um, and also clearly, if people have been following the press, um, you'll be aware of, again, that financial uncertainty in the markets around about the year end, and therefore the implications that has around about the work that's required by auditors in relation to asset valuations. Most notably, that work reflects the level three investments. So I think traditionally what used to be called unquoted, uh, but also direct property investments, because um, I think I mentioned before in the last plan, that valuation uncertainty around about um, property at the year end as well. So in terms of the risks for the pension fund, uh, management override is still in there. So again, that focus on manual intervention journals estimates and judgments. But the other key risk is around about those valuation of unquoted investments. And that's because of uh, A, there's no obvious, easily publicly available information to sort of ratify the value at the year end. Um, so that already increases that risk. But this year, because of that uncertainty in the markets, that risk is higher as well. Uh, and that's required more work by the actuary in terms of getting information 
round about what goes into the pension fund accounts and into the actuarial letters that go to the council, et cetera, et cetera. So those two really are our absolute key area of focus for the pension fund audit. Uh, you will notice, Chair, that we have rebutted the revenue recognition risk in this one. And that's because when you think about the nature of the income for the pension fund, essentially it's contributions payable by the council and or members. It's dividend income and it's interest income. And we don't think that's particularly risky. And it's quite easy to verify against things like letters from uh, fund managers, et cetera, et cetera, banks. In terms of the fee, the fee is as stated and agreed again by the PSA process. Uh, there are no non-audit fees um, highlighted, so therefore no independent issues in terms of non-audit work. Uh, and clearly, both for the council and pension fund, we've got a very robust process to make sure that nobody involved in the audit would have any conflict or independent issues in relation to councillors, independent members or officers of the council. You'll see on um, section seven, page 12, again, uh, we set materiality. Uh, pension funds a little bit different to the council because we set two different materialities. One in overall terms for the pension fund, but we set a lower one for the fund account. And that's because we feel that the using that overall one for the fund account where the values are a lot less would be inappropriate. Again, trivial remains quite high, but that's if you think about the nature of the funds and the value of assets uh, that are managed by the fund, you can see why that's quite a, a large number. And again, uh, anything we identify below that level, we discuss with Chris and the team around about amendment, but we wouldn't necessarily report that to the audit committee. Anything above that, we would report. Uh, we don't have any particular specific materiality areas like um, member allowances, etc because they don't really apply to the pension fund. They're dealt with in the council audit. Uh, again, uh, we have one appendix here, the key communications point. I won't go through that chair because it basically repeats the council one. It's just bit setting out when we're going to tell you certain things we're required to by the standards. Again, chair, I'm not, not going to say much more than that. The pension fund audit plan is comparatively straightforward. Uh, but just to reinforce that the risk really is around about the valuation of unquoted investments at the year end. That's going to be the key focus of the audit. Happy to. Yeah, th thank you for that. And I think it's fair to say that the risks you've highlighted um, aren't just um, solely risks for this council. It, it's for the whole of the pensions um, sector, as it were. Uh, well, to reassure you, Chair, uh, Mazar, I think now do something like 11 or 12 local government pension fund audits. I'm responsible for four of those. Uh, it probably won't surprise you to hear that um, the risks are exactly the same in every single one. For exactly the same yeah, reason. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I see uh, Georgine has now returned. So we'll see how things go. Happy to take any yep. other questions, Joe. Yep, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Councillor Swithenbank? Um, right, I've got this. Oh, yes, I have. Um, local government pension scheme and our merger. Um, clearly, the market will be uncertain for some period. Will it be 18 months? Will it be two to three years? We're not sure. But in terms of how will you determine the value of our investment strategy in such a volatile market? Um, would it be by comparing our local government pension scheme with the family group. Um, clearly there's an issue of value, which certainly with property has fallen at the present time, but is income more important, the income streams to fund the pensions? So how, how, will, you, how will you judge the actual performance rather than the simple value of the pension fund and what is the, over the next couple of years, which is going to be quite uncertain, no one is sure how this will work out, if that makes sense. How will you determine the performance of our pension scheme against such an uncertain background? And, and, I, and I think the answer to that is that that isn't the role of the external auditor in the context of the pension fund. And clearly we're not the external auditor after this year of the pension fund, that external auditor is the auditor of South Tyneside Council. Um, 
but nevertheless, uh, I would imagine South Tyneside Council, through its use of fund managers, custodians, etc., will will be doing that work, as I'm sure Northumberland Pension Fund has in the past, uh, looking at uh, performance against peers, etc., in terms of investment strategies, etc. Um, but in terms of our focus going forward, um, this year it's an auditing the numbers in your in the account to make sure they're supported by appropriate audit evidence. Um, Next year, we'll be writing to the auditor of South Tyneside Council to request assurance in relation to the numbers that then appear in the county council's accounts. So it's a slightly different thing, really. I don't know if Chris, I think Chris is on the call. I don't know if Chris has got anything to add in terms of uh, fund management performance. Chris Handa is, sorry, should be more specific. Um, I, I don't want, but we're fortunate to have Claire Gorman on. I don't know if she's got some comments you can maybe. Hi. Um, yes, yes, I'm on here. Uh, good morning. No, I don't have anything to add to that, Cameron. Um, I would agree with you completely. It's not within the scope of the audit to look at how the assets are valued or, as you say, the investment strategy. And the assets are transferred on the 1st of April um, as a result of the merger legislation. And they are worth what they're worth. And that will change, frankly, over time. Um, and the fact that the valuation, with the benefit of hindsight, because we're always looking back when we value, may change. You know, the auditors may assess the figures at a particular point in time. They may well change in the future. That isn't particularly relevant because the merger means that the assets are simply taken into the new fund, the merged fund, and they continue to vary with daily movements um, and with things like whether property income continues or is reduced. Um, so it doesn't actually make any difference to the 31st of March 2020 position. Is that Thank okay you. then, Councillor Swinlandbank? Yes. Yep. Do we have any more questions with regards to that pensions report? No. Okay, well, those two reports for the external auditor were just for consideration. If we're happy enough with those now, um, I'd like to thank Cameron for that information and we look forward to the future reports and advancing um, the detail within those um, and the next reports that come from Mazars. And thanks very much for that, Cameron. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We'll move on to item five, report to the Executive Director, Finance and Section 151 Officer, Treasury Management, Annual Report for the Financial Year 1920. Thank you, Chair. If, um, if I could take that report, if okay, yes. please. Thank you, Andy. Thanks. Um, okay, just uh, the report provides a, a review of the Treasury management activity for 1920 and it sets out performance against the Treasury management strategy for 1920 and it also includes a review of the prudential indicators which have, which have been set as well. Um, just picking up on a, on a few specifics, so page four of the report highlights that all the Treasury activity in the in the period has complied with the Treasury indicators, which were set out in the 1920 strategy, and all borrowing undertaken in the period was also within the limits set by the council as well. So just just considering our our borrowing activity for the period, um, which is covered on pages nine and ten of of the report. Page nine highlights that over the year to the 31st of March 20, our ac actual external borrowing increased by 93.4 million and the figure rose up to a total of 824.9 million. And within that, there was 175 million pound of new borrowing and 81.5 million of debt, which was repaid um, or matured. 
We also used 105.6 million of temporary internal resources, which is in lieu of the council borrowing externally to fund the capital programme. This is a, a continuation of a strategy we've used over the past couple of years, because basically using that internal money is actually cheaper than us going externally and borrowing. And I think sort of finally on that page as well, it also highlights that there were 21 new loans over the period. Um, and maturity periods were spread. Um, and this basically, uh, it, it spreads the interest rate risk. So all of our loans aren't maturing in a, in a particular period. Moving on to page 10. Um, page 10 summarized our weighted average interest rate, which was paid on borrowing and, and that rate stood at 2.9%. Um, unfortunately, in terms of, of performance on borrowing, same as last year, we, we don't have the, the, the data available yet from, from SIPFA. And again, as last year, what we'll do once we get that data available, we'll, we'll make it, um, we'll present it to the committee in our next update, which is the, the mid-year review, which takes place at the, um, at the November meeting. Page 10 also covers the actual values of the interest that were paid during the year. Um, so at 22.7 million, it was below the budget by 0.8 million. And this was mainly due to our average interest rates being lower than estimated. So we estimated 3.06%. And as I've mentioned, the actual paid was at 2.9%. Just moving on to our investment activity now, which is covered on pages 11 to 13. On page 11, this confirms that all of our investment activity throughout the period conformed with the council's approved investment strategy. And we actually experienced no liquidity issues over the period as well. Um, in addition, the value of investments increased during the period from 96 million up to 191 million. And this was mainly as a result of the, um, the government support that we received near the end of the year to, to help us with the COVID-19 pandemic. Moving on to page 12, this actually highlights the actual interest received on core treasury investments for the year. And it actually specifies that this was 619,000 above our budget. Our budget figure was 2.1 million. And this was due to the higher investment balances that we had as well. Page 13, um, that highlights the weighted average interest rate received on the year. And that shows a figure of 1.3%. The previous years was 1.39%. Um, so the figure is marginally lower this year than what we'd received in previous years. The main reason for that is because of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we chose to, to keep a lot of our funds in, 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 in liquid funds just in case we needed that fund in, in order to support businesses and vulnerable individuals and, and make sure that the council had no liquidity issues. But inevitably with these liquid funds, the, the rate of return isn't quite as high as we could achieve if we looked at it maybe fixed term investments. Again, in terms of rate of return on the investments, um, as I mentioned before, the, the SIP for data isn't available, but we do have a little bit of data available from our Treasury Advisors Link Asset Services. And again, um, as in previous years, our, our performance has exceeded our, our group benchmark. Um, and again, the main reason for this is because um, we placed a number of investments a few years back, longer term, with other local authorities where we achieved a higher rate of interest. So just finally, just summing up, um, pages 14 and appendix two of the report cover the council's prudential indicators. Um, and these indicators are designed to ensure that the council's capital plans are, are prudent, um, affordable and sustainable. And just to, to, to finalise, really just to highlight that the council has actually operated within these prudential indicators, which were set at budget time. Thank you, Chair, and happy to, happy to take any questions that anybody may have. Georgina, are you going to pick this back up now? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I've given it a good kick. I don't know what's happened. Um, if it happened, 
questions again, just pick up Mark. Okay, so no do apologize. Does anyone have any questions on that report? Any show of hands? Okay, are we content to note that report? Excuse me, Chair Peter Topping. Um, is, is everyone happy with that? Cap Chair Peter Topping is indicating. Oh, <clears throat> Peter, sorry, I didn't see you there. Peter Topping. Sorry, thank, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I was, just very quickly, um, the, the investment activity on page 11, I think I kind of followed what you were saying, but it seems to have moved around over the last three years quite considerably. So this year you've got 191 million. Last year it was 96 million. And in 2018 it was 150 million, if either sort of quick look through the papers. So that's sort of moving quite considerably up and down. And I I think well, I'll, I'll let you explain that. I think I followed what you said, but I just wanted to clarify that. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, um, the, it is right that the position in terms of the investments will will actually change throughout the year. Um, like I like I said this year, the um, the balance has actually increased because we got more funding from central government. Um, it also depends on the level of um, the level of borrowing that we often take in order to fund our capital programs and the timing of utilizing that borrowing. So basically as a council, when we're undertaking borrowing activity to fund the capital program, we, we'll, um, we'll secure that borrowing at times when the interest rates are advantageous. Now, um, what that might mean is that we, we have a higher balance at a point in time, um, which we need to actually invest in order to get a rate of return so so yeah completely right it is it is quite natural that those balances will move around year on year do you want to come back on that peter no okay we're happy to note that report i believe we're now on to b which is the annual governance report an annual governance statement appendix d <clears throat> who's presenting this uh that's myself uh, chair thank you um so thank you yes yeah, so this uh, the paper for this agenda item uh, provides the committee with the details of the annual governance review and also a copy of the draft annual governance statement the the ags so as members will be aware the council has a strategy duty to carry out at least annually a review of its governance arrangements and then to publish the findings of that governance review along with its uh, statement of accounts. And this should be done in line with the principles that are outlined in the 2016 framework on delivering good governance in local government, which was uh, published by SITFA and SOLIS. So by producing and publishing an AGS each year, the council meets those statutory requirements and it's the audit committee that has the responsibility for reviewing the council's corporate governance arrangements and for considering the AGS. Uh, the 2016 framework outlines seven principles of good governance in local authorities, and these are outlined on pages four and five of the main report. So they're shown in the uh, wheel diagram on page four, and there's kind of further explanatory detail in the table on page five. Uh, and the framework basically defines good governance in the public sector as achieving the intended outcomes while acting in the public interest at all times. Now, the, uh, the council's governance framework is effectively all the different systems and processes and policies and procedures that are in place right across the organisation. And these have been summarised into a local code of corporate governance, uh, which maps each of them against those seven good governance principles that are in the 2016 framework. And that's uh, attached to the report as Appendix A. And in line with best practice, this local code will be published as a separate document on the website. And that's so that the AGS itself can be much more summarised and a much more user friendly and publicly accessible document. Um, so the main body of the report then on page seven onwards outlines the processes that have been undertaken for the annual governance review and where the sources of assurance uh, comes from. So it outlines things like uh, the governance review that was carried out in each service area, the corporate risk register, uh, the work of this audit committee and the scrutiny committees, uh, the work of internal audit, and also um, 
assurance from external inspections. Uh, and attached to the report are further detailed appendices, so appendices B, 1, 2 and 3 that show for each service area the government's arrangements that are in place locally there. Again, also mapped to each of the seven principles of the 2016 framework and also highlights any improvements in governance that were made during the, uh, the period since the last governance review and also any planned improvements for governance for the year ahead. Um, as part of the overall Council's annual governance review, progress against the corporate level actions that were agreed in last year's AGS were also considered and the outcome of that review is shown in the table in Appendix C to the report. Um, and as good governance is a cycle of continuous improvement, the review also considered any actions that could be taken to further strengthen the Council's governance arrangements. Uh, and also the impact of any new governance challenges that arose during the year, such as the, obviously coronavirus, which is uh, referenced in the paper on page 18. And so the proposed governance improvement plan for the coming year is shown in the table in Appendix D. And so finally, the draft annual governance statement itself is attached as Appendix E. Uh, so this summarises everything together, uh, including the proposed improvement actions in a more user-friendly and, and glossy document. Uh, the AGS is signed off by the Chief Executive and the Leader of the Council uh, and includes an opinion on how effective the Council considers the government arrangements to have been. Uh, and as I said earlier, it will be published along with the draft accounts for a period of public inspection and it will also be audited by the external auditors. Um, so happy to take any questions, Chair. Does anyone have any questions? Councillor Grimshaw is indicating, Chair. Yep, Councillor Grimshaw. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it's on just the, on the main body of the report, uh, uh, D, and it's actually on page uh, number 12, and it's the, um, the second paragraph down. In January 2020, Cabinet approved the establishment of a group of holding up to 10 limited companies to support the expansion of commercial business and opportunities being developed. Uh, and once it's established, there will be um, there will be directors and secretaries, etc., and also councillors was was going to be actually on that uh, body. Could I just ask for an update on that, please? Councillor Oliver's indicated he wants to respond. Thank you, uh, thank you, Councillor Grimshaw. Yes, uh, there's, there's ongoing work, um, and there's been a small uh, group set up. Uh, which is meeting every every two weeks uh, to review progress. I think the next meeting is actually tomorrow morning. Um, the there's legal legal advice and uh, professional accounting advice has been taken, and really at this stage it's about creating a structure. So there's a sort of holding company, and then the ability to create um, individual uh, trading companies below that uh, as as required, um, and. So, you know, the, the, there are sort of areas including, you know, possibly tourism, possibly uh, broadband and so on that, that may fall into that. So just to be absolutely clear, there will be um, councillor representation and almost certainly um, other external uh, non-exec director representation on, on each of those companies and the, and the holding company. Uh, but nothing, nobody has been appointed yet and, and nobody's been approached about that or, or anything. So it's really, it's at the stage where the, the legal work um, and the professional advice is, is, is sort of coming to a conclusion. Um, and as soon as things start happening, we'll, we'll keep everybody uh, properly informed. Councillor Grimshaw. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just that, you know, that I was appointed on that board uh, from the Labour uh, Party, and and I would have thought that if that was the case, that we should have been involved from the beginning, um, so that you know we could we could have sat on this particular board and weren't excluded. And it feels as though if it's been set up and you're talking to different people, that uh, our group has been you know like uh, not represented. Uh, no, I, 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 I mean I uh, I think probably. Uh, slightly jumping the gun there as soon as the board is set up uh, then that will you know those appointments will take place and uh, but at the moment there is nothing to uh, to be on the board of uh, so there's no intention to exclude anybody and and uh, you know as soon as that that happens then you, you'll you'll be invited and uh, and there'll be proper discussion with with uh, with the other uh, political groups so we'll, we'll keep you very well informed you've got my assurance in that. Thank you. 
Okay. <clears throat> Anyone else have any questions? Can I can I just ask something? One thing I don't actually like this time of year when it's the annual governance statement because there's people basically marking their own homework and we're kind of being asked to rob a stamp, which is hundreds of premises attached to what we're approving. Let me give you an example. I mean, one of the principles of corporate governance, you know, that we all jump up and down and say, look what we're doing, behaving with integrity, demonstrating strong commitment to ethical values and respecting the rule of law. Now, if you remember 18 months ago, some time ago, there was a report that we received um, regarding what seemed to be an abuse of taxpayers' money. Um, do you remember the trip to Cannes and all that? Um, we agreed to make a referral to the Standards Committee um, on that because this was the kind of thing that lowers the reputation of the council as, as a whole in the eyes of, eyes of the public. We haven't heard anything back about this. I don't know who, I mean, I know Chris, you weren't in the council at the time. I don't know if Nick or somebody wants to respond to that, but we haven't heard anything back about that referral to standards. And members of the public asked me about what happened, what was the accountability. And then we're expected to say, yes, we stand up to ethical principles. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can certainly uh, get an answer for you on that. Uh, I mean, as you can imagine, I, I, I'm not, I don't get regularly briefed on on uh, the you know the internal machinations of the of the standards committee quite rightly because they would you know it would be it would be uh, in telling me things that I shouldn't be aware of. Uh, so I think we need to refer that to Liam and. Uh, uh, and see if we can get a, a, a response on that for you. So I'll, I'll pick that up with Chris after the meeting and we'll we'll work out the best way to get a response for you on that. Great. Chair, um, Rickaby, Swinburne and also Stephen Watson are indicating. Okay, um, I'll start with Councillor Rickaby. Yes, thanks Chair. Um, I'm referring to Appendix C and Appendix D and you use the word about re reputation of the Council. I want to ask about the consultation and st stakeholder uh, engagement, how it states that um, I know we're trying to put a new uh, um, method in. Um, and it said it will be realised target date is September 2020. I understand we're in, in awkward times. Will that be realised? Because obviously if people can't, uh, you know, if the members of the public can't actually be consulted and actually give their views, then again, it might have a knock-on effect to our reputation. Yeah. Can I pick yeah. that up, Councillor Hill? Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, yes, I'm confident it will be. I think the procurement pl uh, process, there's a basically a consultation platform is uh, has, has is being procured. Um, and I think that will give us a... Um, uh, uh, a, a really good facility to be able to do uh, everything from very short, sharp um, consultations that might inform policy through to uh, fairly comprehensive uh, co uh, consultations that, that might be required uh, statutorily. So uh, yes, it's, it's happening. It's an interesting idea. Obviously, COVID has impacted uh, we aren't having face-to-face -face meetings, so uh, it, uh, and members of the public can't turn up to meetings, and uh, uh, and you know that, that's everything from sort of planning meetings to scrutiny meetings uh, to full full council meetings, and, uh, and we're very mindful of that. And obviously, governments have have responded and re you know relaxed the regulations so we can hold meetings like this over over Zoom. Um, but I think what we're seeing is probably higher levels of public participation and public uh, interest than, than in the pre-Zoom, pre-COVID era. Mm -hmm. People have got used to the idea that they can dial into a meeting and watch what goes on. And so I would hope that one of the sort of uh, the positive uh, consequences of, of this terrible pandemic is that we, we basically have a, a, a greater public um, interaction with the important work that, that local authorities do right across the, the country. So, and I think the, the the consultation platform will be will be part of that. Thank you, right. Councillor Rickaby. Did you want to come back, or was that it? That's fine. Um, I saw Stephen Watson. 
So, thank you, Chair. It's it's actually just picking up a point that um, that you actually raised yourself when I think you used the phrase mocking your own homework. Um, th th this is a very comprehensive document, and I, I will say it is excellent. And I think it's probably based on a SIFTA model, which is uh, which is part of the answer to the question I'm going to ask. I imagine, uh, but on Appendix B1, the service assurance statements, uh, which actually go through the governance arrangements for all the different areas marked against the seven key areas. Uh, I think it would be so much more robust if we could actually see the third line of defence in there. In other words, how many of these assurances and statements have actually been tested independently recently? Uh, because obviously an awful lot of this hangs on the, um, the verdict of individual managers uh, that these assurances, that these, these governance arrangements are in place and working. But what we don't see from this document is an independent affidavit to say, yes, they've been tested and yes, it passed the test. So I think. Um, getting back to the chair's point about marking your own homework, there is a touch of trust attached to this, um, which maybe could be short-circuited by including um, the, the number of times that these areas have been audited over the last whatever number of years, and what the verdict of the audit was. Um, it might not be possible to use in the model that you're using, it's a CIFA prescribed model, but it just, when I was reading this last night, the thing that was jumping out to me was, um, do we know these, uh, these, these governance arrangements are actually working and are fit for purpose? We know that they're there, but we did, are they actually working? I think, that's a point. Uh, I, I was just going to say, sorry, it's Alison Mitchell. When the others have um, responded to Stephen Watson's point, I wonder if I might also speak at that time. Thank you. Okay, Councillor uh, Oliver. Well, I was just, just going to make a, a quick point that that's something I can uh, uh, pick up with uh, with Chris and discuss with Alison. I think it's a point very well made, uh, and I'm sure in many cases. I mean, just looking through the. Uh, the things that are referred to in, in what is a pretty comprehensive uh, document encompassing pretty much every council service, uh, that, that much of that has been tested. And I think Alison's probably about to uh, uh, go on and tell us how much, of, how, how, how much of that has been included in the work of the internal audit team. Uh, and maybe the solution is to provide, if we've got a, a SIP for sort of template here, we could possibly adjust it and, and, and have a, a section at the end that, that lists all of the uh, external, whether that be through the, the internal audit service or through other, other checks and balances through statutory uh, procedures or uh, statutory reporting that could basically list the, the, the evidence that, that supports the assertions of, of, of the officers in responding to their individual service areas. So yes, point well made and we'll, we'll pick that up. And I'm sure Alison will add, add to that. Yeah, Alison. Uh, thank you, Chair. And yes, I would absolutely endorse what Councillor Oliver has just said. I think the important thing is that the annual governance statement and internal audit are two separate, two separate things. The annual governance statement is a statement which is produced by the Council's senior management um, and it's meant to be an honest reflection of how the organisation sees its governance arrangements and what it's done to monitor and measure those. So internal audit will be one of the strands of assurance. There are a number of other strands of assurance in the third line of defence, external audit, for example, risk management being another. Um, but there is actually a paragraph included in the Chief Internal Auditor's opinion, which Kevin as Chief Internal Auditor will take you through later when we get to that item, where internal audit highlight the areas that they consider should be thought about when management are produced in the annual governance statement. So I, I think Stephen Moffat makes a very, very good point, but just to be clear that the two things are quite separate and internal audit coverage is based on an assessment of audit risk. But we'll be glad to bring more information back to the audit committee in the future. Great. Chris, did you want to come in at all? Um, I suppose just the, the, the detail in B1 was to provide further assurance um, in terms of the local code of conduct. So that, that itself is part of the assurance. As, as Alison sort of touched on, there are the three lines of defence models. So these are um, embedded process and procedures. We have the assurance from the work of internal audit, which is um, 
is obviously risk based and and uh, developed a part of the um, the audit plan. We have the statutory rules in place. We have the assurance from internal inspections. But um, we we we'll we'll take on board everything. Saying we'll catch up with Nick and we'll have a look at this list and see what things can be tested. Uh, I suppose I'm just aware that it's, it's a very long list of sort of stuff. So to try and independently audit those, we might be setting ourselves a challenge. You know, some things about uh, having minutes for meetings and that that sort of stuff. But uh, it is a, it's a good comment made, and we'll, we'll we'll take it away and we'll, we'll have a look at that. I think. Sorry, Alison. Yeah. Oh, it was just me, Chair. I just wanted to mention something. Oh, sorry, Mark. Karen, yeah. Yeah, it's no problem. Um, Chris had mentioned some before, and I know Councillor Rickaby had, had touched on something similar, but he mentioned about public view, and um, Councillor Rickaby mentioned about consultation. Um, so this would be obviously going for public view, and, and no doubt the accounts will be as well, and it's something I had to raise uh, yesterday in the in north of Tyne as well. Not everyone has access via computer. So it's a case of making sure we have arrangements for the public to be able to access, you know, whether it's county hall or whatever, to see what they need to um, physically. And with the current situation, that's not going to be easy. Now, I know we probably won't have an influx of people sort of clawing at the door to be able to see these documents. That's not usually the case. But we need to make sure that um, things are in place for people to be able to view these, you know, if they want to. Um, so it's just, you know, do we have the provision? Are we going to uh, put those things in place? Should people want to view these, want to view the accounts, etc.? We need to have these um, th these preparations made should that take place. Councillor yes. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, two sort of two separate points there. One is around uh, publicly viewing the documents. Um, uh, and I think that there are every year there are arrangements made for those documents to be available for inspection at, at County Hall for people that can't access them online. So that, that you know, that will be the case again um, this year and in, in, into the future. In terms of people accessing uh, meetings where they don't have uh, a, a, a decent broadband connection like Councillor Hill, uh, then uh, I think um, we, we, we are looking uh, at the moment uh, in terms of the, the, the library reopening programme. I think that's a, you know, a, a starting point. Uh, so library and customer service centres. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of work being done by officers in, in that area, looking at health and safety assessments and, and how the process might work. And obviously within our libraries, we have uh, publicly available access to, uh, to, to computers. So it's something we've been talking about every week. Uh, there's a lot of work going on um, and every local authority in the country is, is basically assessing the sort of government guidance uh, Indeed, I think we've had a letter uh, from uh, DCMS uh, minister recently asking us to report back to them what we're what we're doing, as has every other local authority. Um, so we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, we should have some some news fairly soon. But there is a, a lot of work going on in the background to to get that sorted. Thank you. Um, just a, a point. In terms of the principles of corporate governance that we have, they're probably based on a standard model. But it's going back to my original point and what Stephen Watson said, there isn't anything about the importance of independence and objectivity. Um, I'm seeing a general principle and I'll use a specific example. Um, we, the council presented with a report um, about the impact of the judicial review hearing into Ledbury Parish Council, sorry, Ledbury Town Council. And the people that we sought advice from about the implications of this um, judgment was NULC. Now, NULC were embarrassed by that report. So something as simple as that, I'm not going to go into the specific details, but just if you're getting advice, you wouldn't get advice from somebody that's embarrassed by the report. So I just think... There's a, you know, a few other things creep in, but I just think it's important. So when we're getting advice, ask, you know, is this independent, objective advice? Have they got an axe to grind? Is there any reason to it's unspecific? It's not exactly the same personnel, but you don't ask an organisation who are embarrassed 
by the findings of the report and also in, um, advising Herefordshire County Council on the back of it. So I don't know if we can add something about the importance of independence and objectivity. This isn't about politics, this is just about always thinking is the advice we're getting in is you know a staff member marking their own work obviously the questions could they be seen as being completely objective um and it's the case in any reports we're receiving we need to always just be mindful is this um robust and independent yeah i, I, can, I, can, I can make a a bit of an attempt at uh, answering that but but not comprehensively i don't really uh i'm not familiar with the detail of the of the ledbury uh report uh, i guess the point is that um i think where we need to take legal advice we often do and that's usually uh as a council from independent legal experts so it'd normally be from a, a firm of uh, of, of solicitors or a, or a, a barrister, a QC, a council um, on on a specific issue, and we would normally go to somebody who has um, expertise in that area. And I'm sure any advice taken um, from NALC on the on the implications of the Ledbury report um, was probably one part of an overall assessment of how to deal with any recommendations. From that report, so I'm, I'm also, you know, we've got a, an experienced uh, monitoring officer who's been doing it for for, for many years, um, and, and and they will have, you know, he will have been having discussions, I'm sure, with other monitoring officers across the region and perhaps across the country, uh, in in terms of dealing with that. So, but I accept the point. You know, we've got to be careful who we take the advice from. We we need to make sure that the advice is is truly independent um and you know broadly with what I, I i see in in my uh role within this portfolio is is that that often does happen and people are proper experts who are totally independent of the council are called upon for for that advice in terms of the wider picture uh of of assessing sort of this report i think it probably comes back to the point that allison's made is this is a this is um a report by officers uh uh looking at how officers are implementing uh the the, the sort of governance requirements according to the, the the framework uh so by very nature you know by its very nature there is an element of of, of marking your own homework the point that allison's made is that there is a wider governance procedure in place uh, to to question and challenge that with the risk about risk based sort of work of of internal audit and then ultimately once a year uh, an external audit process as well so uh, I'm I'm pretty comfortable overall that the level of scrutiny uh, of the work of the council is 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 pretty high the bar is is pretty high uh, but yeah do take your point around that specific uh, issue without understanding the detail. Councillor Swithenbank, did you have your hand up? No? Anyone else? Anyone see anyone that I'm not seeing? Okay. Now, if I ask you to look at the recommendations on D, um, it says it's recommended that we note the principles of good governance outlined in the 2016 SIPFA framework. I presume we're all happy with that part. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Show of hands, maybe. Note the progress and outcomes from the Council's annual governance review, including the progress made against 2018 19 improvement actions shown in Appendix C, and the significant changes in government improvements made in each service area shown in Appendix B2. Again, we're just noting this, so I presume everyone's happy with that. Yep. Yeah. Approve the updated local code of governance shown in Appendix A, which has been updated following the annual governance review. This is the local code of corporate governance. Um, apart from the comments that we've made, which will obviously be minuted, is, is everyone happy that we do that? Yeah. Okay. 
Note the further planned improvement actions to further enhance accounts governance arrangements shown in Appendix D following the review, and we've made suggestions on that. So again, everyone content with that. This is the one which I might ask for people's suggestion how we should treat this. It says, approve the draft annual governance statement shown in Appendix E that will be published with the draft statement of accounts for a period of public inspection. Um, how do people think we should treat this? Because we had this debate last time and we it's not actually our decision to approve it. Um, obviously, the cabinet, etc., would like us to endorse it, but we don't necessarily, I believe, have to approve it. So, how is there any suggestions how we should treat the last line of the recommendations? How did we treat it last year? I seem to remember we it was ascertain ascertained that we don't actually it's not for us to prove. So if we re rejected it, it wouldn't it would be embarrassing, but it wouldn't mean that it's rejected. It would still go forward. So I think we prefer to treat it that we noted it with our with our comments. That's not to say we disagree with it, but just given it's not really our decision and given there's so many <clears throat> details and hundreds of premises within it, did we happy to say we agreed with all of those? If that makes sense. Can I ask a question of officers then? Is, is there any, uh, so maybe this is one for Chris uh, and I don't know if there's anybody from legal uh, on the call, um, but is this an issue if that wording was changed to note, uh, it would be consistent with the paragraphs above. Um, uh, although, well, it wouldn't actually, would it? It wouldn't be consistent with the middle paragraph, which is, which also says approve. Um, but uh, it, it, my, do we? Can I come in? My, my understanding, uh, Councillor Oliver, is that uh, under the accounting regulations, the AGS has to be approved by a committee of the council, the full council itself, and from the terms of yeah. reference of the council, it is this committee, the audit committee, that has the um, that duty to approve the AGS. So I know know what what the members are saying, but it's it's more a review of it. And um, from the discussion we just had, is there any omissions from here that you feel from you from your, um, your 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 knowledge and your the work of the audit committee is what your, your tackling this is? I also, may want to come in and add to this. And obviously, um, external audit will be doing the same review themselves, so they will be auditing this document as part of the. Um, uh, the, the accounts. So just as the council approves the accounts, which are again quite, fairly comprehensive and detailed, th th this is part of that um, assurance suite of documents that's made public. So it, it's a, possibly a timing thing, but um, audit committee should review and approve this before we put it out to the public um, as part of the draft accounts, but it, the final accounts won't be signed off along the AGS until um, November for the, the delayed statutory deadline. It says draft and your governance statement. So will we get the final one brought back to us? Yes, it will come as part of the final annual accounts once it's been uh, through external audit. Okay. Anything you want to add to that, Alison? So I guess what would... Sorry, Sorry, Chair. I was just trying to see what was um, the annual governance statement went to the March meeting of committee last year. I was just trying to look up and see what that says. I think the important thing from my perspective for the audit committee is to be assured about the way in which the annual governance statement has been put together. So if it was a very glib you know, a very thin document, which didn't demonstrate that there'd been a degree of rigour um, in the way that Chris and his team have put that together, that would be a, a cause for concern for the audit committee. But what I would be comforted about as a, you know, a previous auditor is the, um, the evidence base, which has been included along with the annual governance statement. So it isn't something which has just been kind of put down there on paper. And um, there is a very, very clear process which has been gone through to gather the information 
to self-reflect as the senior team of the organisation on what is going well and what isn't going so well in terms of governance. And I think it's also an important point to make that it isn't about um, just putting down everything that you think is wrong. That's a very important part of the annual governance statement, anything where you think there is improvement. But it's also about making sure that there's due recognition for the things that the authority is doing well. And I know there are references to external inspection reports and so on um, within the document. So I think that that should be considered by the committee in the round when deciding whether to approve. But Chris is quite right in terms of the rules around a committee of council having to um, approve the annual governance statement and that being timed in with the publication of the accounts. Would anyone like to make a recommendation? Chair, comes uh, Peter Toppings indicating. Yep, yeah, Peter. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I have some sympathy with the, the point that you are making because while it, it, my assessment is that this is a pretty comprehensive uh, document and as Alison has said, the evidence is there that it's been pretty comprehensively put together. And there is commentary in the assurance in the annual government statement about you know, issues which have not gone well, as well as issues which have gone well. So it seems pretty balanced. But as you're saying, Chair, the, the lay reader of this would, would interpret the word approve as being that this is, this is something that the audit committee is approving rather than this is a document that comes from the executive. So I do have some sympathy with your with your issue and I, and I have come across it in, in elsewhere. So I'm supporting you. <laughs> OK, <clears throat> therefore, and I, th and I think it's the it's the emphasis on I always reluctant when there's long detailed reports you know, to agree something verbatim and give assurance. That, that's not to say that you don't give assurance. I know this sounds like you're sitting on the fence, but I'm always just slightly cautious, and particularly as it's a draft, and particularly as it's not actually on. <laughs> so I'm going to make a proposal, um, and I'll ask for a show of hands on this. Um, and if it fails, obviously somebody can make another recommendation. But I propose, and I'm sorry, of course, the um, the um, co-opted members don't actually have a vote. Um, but actually, I might ask, Stephen, do you have a thought on that? I'd be interested in your thought because you don't actually have a vote on this about how we should treat the last part of the recommendation. Um, I, I, I just do echo Peter's last um uh, comments to be quite honest chair is that um, a this is a very comprehensive document b it is supported by a lot of good um, evidence from the the first and second line of defense um, it does make reference to the third line of defense which is good although you do have to look elsewhere to find the third line of defense opinion on a lot of this stuff which was part of part of my point earlier on um, in terms of whether we endorse it or not or not endorse it i i think that we can endorse it as it stands I think we can endorse it as it stands because it is what it is. It is what the first and second line of defence believe are the um, the governance arrangements and the 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 the, the, um, the risk control in their areas. And I think that is what it is, and that's what it's saying. Um, so in that in that respect, I think we can endorse it because it is what it is. It is what people have evidenced and have given um, an assurance and affidavit. And it is at the end of the day, um, the managers and directors of the the council's job. To actually give these governance assurances so i think we wouldn't be sticking out there to say yes to it um, my point earlier on was largely around um we would feel a lot more comfortable we would have a warmer glow as a committee third line of defense um assurances in some of these areas but as it is what it is and um chris and nick have explained earlier on and Alison as well is that it is very much an opinion of the people who are the first and second line of defense um, I don't have a. I don't actually particularly feel uncomfortable about endorsing it as a document. So, okay, 
What I'm going to prove, the word approve seems to indicate it is our responsibility to approve it. I'm listening to this debate and we're not getting clear advice. And I'm wondering whether deleting approve and putting note in where we are yeah. accepting it, recognising it, but it's not our... I'm to propose that as well, so I'll second that. I'll actually just read through the names to make it easier. So the proposal is to change the word approve um, to note. Uh, Nick? Nick? Uh, sorry, could I just ask a question before, because uh, I think this might uh, impact on how this gets dealt with, uh, and, and there may be somebody on the call that can answer this question. I guess, I think what Chris was saying earlier is that, that uh, the council has uh, delegated this report to the audit committee to be approved. Uh, I guess it, if the word is changed and it's not formally approved, my question is, can it be approved? Because I don't think anybody's got a problem with the report. It's a, it's a, it's a matter of principle of whether it's the audit committee's role to approve it, that seems to be in, in question. Um, and so my question to Chris or to any other officer is that if it isn't, if the word is changed here, uh, can it then be approved by council or, or any other committee, uh, by cabinet or any other committee? Because obviously, you know, there's a statutory requirement to do this uh, and, and somehow it needs to get dealt with. Can council Wickerby also indicating? Councillor Rickby, do you want to come in and then We'll take yes, this to the yeah, yeah. I mean, I know we're playing with words here, and this may may seem a bit woolly, but could we use the word "welcome" the report? That way, we don't know we note it, but we're not approving it. I don't know. It's just a, I've just been trying to think of words that, that might um, fit in and, and be acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, Counts, uh, sorry, Stephen Watson. Um, yeah, Chair, thank you. Um, just picking up on Nick's point, I, I have been mulling over since all this discussion. I can see both sides, but I think Nick, Nick, Nick makes a very important point. If we don't approve it as a committee, where does it get approved? But if it doesn't get approved anywhere, what have we done with this document? Have we actually effectively stymied it? I'm a little bit concerned that actually we could do more damage than, than good by, uh, by worrying we about the word approved too much. We is there anybody with an opinion on that? I think we just need some clarification on 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 the impact of of the changing the word here. Can it be dealt with in another way? I don't know we did have a very similar thing last year, and it was agreed that we could. We did note it. We we've had. We, I remember we had pretty much the same debate last year. Um, and of course, as I say, this is a draft report, and I think not just my technical problems dealing with sort of long reports don't lend themselves quite as well to this format. Um, and this is a draft report. Um, we haven't proposed any specific changes, although we've made some comments and very good feedback, I think, to that. Um, and obviously it would, it would come back to our committee in its full form as well. So I think unless anyone has anything, I think I'll, and I'll read out the names. So I'll, I'll put this proposal Sorry, Chair, could we just get an officer opinion on the impact of this before before you ask the members to vote? Yes. Well, Luke uh, came I, I in, but Alison? Sorry, I was just about to read from the Accounts and Audit Regulations 2015, which are the relevant um, piece of legislation. Regulation 6.1 says, a relevant authority must each financial year conduct a review of the effectiveness of the system of internal control required by an earlier regulation and prepare a, an annual governance statement. Um, the relevant authority um, following the review must consider the findings of the review by a committee or by members of the authority meeting as a whole and approve the annual governance statement prepared in accordance with the earlier paragraph by resolution of a committee or members of the authority meeting as a, as a whole. And then it goes on and, and gives them more information on that. So in Northumberland County Council, um, the approval of the accounts is something which is undertaken by the audit committee. Um, so if Chris, Chris may wish to come in because he's the author of the report, 
but I think that the um, rules are quite clear that the annual governance statement does need approval. Yes, th those are the regulations I referred to earlier. So there is a requirement for approval. So if, and I, I, my understanding is from the constitution that this committee has the responsibility for approving the accounts on the AGS. Um, to answer Nick's question, if this committee was not minded to do that, then yes, the uh, the full council could or another constitution committee. I think Cameron wants to come in. I, I would absolutely support what Alison and Chris have just said, but if we get to the end of the audit process and the council hasn't approved its annual governance statement, we wouldn't be able to give that bit of the audit report. We need to modify it because it must be approved. Okay, but it is the full council that does approve it. Usually, I presume, ideally, you think with a recommendation from the audit committee, but the actual approval is the full council. Uh, it depends what your constitution says, Chair. To be honest, as Alison's just read from the regulations, that uh, a local authority, whichever type of local authority, has two choices. One is to reserve that power for full council, uh, and the second is to delegate that responsibility to full council to an appropriate committee. Uh, in my experience, which I've been doing a, a, far longer than I wish, wish I had at times, is that uh, most local authorities delegate responsibility for the approval of accounts to the audit committee. Not all, but most. And associated with that, given the annual governance statement is then consolidated into the accounts, generally speaking, uh, that delegation also uh, delegates responsibility for approval of the annual governance statement too. Uh, some places don't do that, but the vast majority in my experience do. So your constitution is broadly the same as everybody else's in that regard. Um, clearly, the committee has to make a decision around about the evidence base that supports the statement, uh, but that is somewhat different to the actual approval process. So if your constitution says it has to be the audit committee, it has to be the audit committee, um, Full council could, of course, still do that, but if there's a clear delegation in place, it seems to me that you do have that responsibility as it stands at present. And I think that's correct. Um, approval of the accounts in Northumberland is delegated to audit committee. Um, but uh, if this is something um, over which the, the the committee, if the committee would find it of value, and assuming that we we'll have time, and I'm looking to Chris in terms of the timetable, what it would be possible for do, to do is for internal audit to do a review of the preparation of the annual governance statement and bring a report back to next meeting of audit committee, which would then give committee some assurance about the process which is being employed by Chris and the senior team to put that together. That wouldn't be to say that internal audit could verify absolutely everything within the statement, but it might give a degree of comfort and assurance to committee about the way the methodology which has been employed. Uh, shall I possibly just reply, uh, Chair? So, I mean, it might be helpful just to consider what the AGS is saying. So, it, it is ultimately signed off by the Chief Executive and the uh, the Leader of the Council, and there's an opinion in there that's basically saying that you know there's no perfect system of um, of absolute assurance uh, but in the round you know we've got good governance and there's nothing being highlighted in the year uh, the the suite of information that's been provided kind of demonstrates the controls that are in place mapped to the expected um, principles in the CIFA SOLIS um, good governance framework so with audit committee's knowledge is there anything that is not in the AGS that you would have expected to have seen um, in light of the fact that also there's external assurance from the three uh, three defence models, the document itself will be ordered by external audit. Uh, so th that's the kind of the context of being asked to approve it. So uh, is the council, so is the audit committee assured that there's nothing in here that you would expect to see? Um, and the, the opinion in the AGS is a reasonable based on the evidence that's being put forward uh, in the pack of information. Mark, did you want to come in? Uh, thanks, Chair. As it's just been explained there, it appears that <clears throat> it's our duty to sign off the AGS and <clears throat> um, the approval of accounts, but um, that would appear to be the final of the AGS and the final accounts, and we're not at that stage yet. We're only at a draft stage. Yeah. So therefore, um, I would be more comfortable it, it, it comes across that there's some certain element that is not sitting well at this stage with the committee so 
as we're not at the final stage, um, it seems that something may need to be adjusted. Alison has just pointed out there that you know, some further work could be done to come back to the committee. If we were at the final stage, then yes, I would agree it has to be an approval. Um, we don't appear to be at that stage yet. So as has been suggested, it may be that it's noted um, and further work may need to be, you know, taking place, further discussion, etc. until we get to the final stage where it has to be an approval. You know, this is just what I'm gathering from this meeting at this point, and I understand what the regulations say, but that seems to me, my understanding, to be at the final um, account and final AGS, and, and we're not there yet, we're only at a draft stage. I think unless, I'm quite unless I'm understanding this wrong. There's a, I think there's a I'm quite keen, yeah, I'm quite keen to move this on. Um, if everyone is everyone happy because we've got other reports and obviously we've had a lot of debate on on this um is anyone really got something pressing to say or is everyone happy that we move to the vote just just quickly um chair um, and yeah. just to, to echo mark's comments as i think that a, I think that we've established we do as a committee have the responsibility to approve this, but B, obviously there have been some caveats raised uh, during this discussion. There's quite a useful discussion of a very good document, I have to add, that's very thorough. But I think Alison has made a very pragmatic and sensible suggestion of doing a very short, brief health check, if you like, for the next committee meeting, where we can find, see the final document with that, that annex, if you like, or that separate paper, which will give us the assurance that we need to actually put our hands up and approve this document fully at that point. And I think that if that's the way forward, that's a very sensible and pragmatic way to take us forward personally. Uh, can I add as well? Yeah, you haven't spoken yet, David. Uh, yeah, thank you. No, I, I agree with that. I think, I think we're getting into semantics on this. Um, the, if you look at the key points, the key issues on, on just on the second page of the report, it doesn't mention approving anything, but all we're being asked to do is approve the draft. We're not being asked to approve the statement. We're being asked to approve the draft that's in front of us. It's not as if we're not going to approve it. So I think, personally, think we should just stick with the wording and move on. That's right. Okay. Um, Chair, I'm just I'm, sorry, Chair. I'm not yep. sure. Lynn Grimshaw's had a lot of connection problems during this item, and I'm not sure whether she's indicating because she hasn't been on screen. Yeah. I think I'm going to have to move to the vote because we've had a, a, a debate on this. So I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure everyone agrees and maybe just ask for show sure hands that we'll request the report that Alison has offered to do to give that assurance. Could everyone just show sure hand that we, that's obviously sensible, we're happy with that. Yeah. I'll just read everyone's names out. Yeah, I'll just read everyone's names out and whether you, the proposal to change the last part to note the draft annual governance statement it's draft at the moment, we note it. That's the proposal that's been made and seconded. So I'm just reading down the list. I vote, I support that motion. Councillor Swinburne? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Councillor Grimshaw? She's just left the meeting again. You might want to come back to her. At, but as I say, she has had a lot of connection problems. Councillor Purvis? Agreed. Councillor Rickaby? Agree. Councillor Swithenbank. Councillor Swithenbank. Could you unmute? Ian, could you unmute? Agreed. Councillor Towns. Agreed. Okay. So, well, obviously, Councillor Grimshaw is having problems, but that's um, that's obviously majority. Well, that's everyone. Um, so we note the report, if obviously can be ministered all the sort of comments and we'll look forward to receiving that extra assurance report in the next meeting when we receive the finalised document. Okay. Thank you. Now we move to the annual report of the Local Pensions Board, which is your Appendix E. Who's speaking to this? I'll take this one, Chair. Thank you. Good morning, only just. So, has everybody got Appendix E in their packs? Yep. So, this is 
Uh, Northumberland County Council is required uh, to have a local pension board for each of the schemes that it administers. So in 2019-20, Northumberland administered the local government pension scheme, LGPS, and the firefighters pension scheme, FPS. So it had two boards, one for each scheme. The local pension boards were set up under terms of reference in 2015 that were agreed by full council. They were required to set up their own terms of reference, they're not committees. They have a scrutiny type role. Their role is to assist Northumberland County Council in its role as scheme man manager administering each of these two schemes. They are not decision-making bodies. And the terms of reference require that the annual reporting of the local pension boards comes to the audit committee each year. So as I say, local pension boards were established in 2015. So this is the fifth year in which you have received the annual reports. If you turn a couple of pages in with an appendix E to annex A, what we have here is for each of the boards, we've got an annual report which has been prepared by officers and the chair of the board um, in consultation. So this is the view of each of the two chairs of the two boards. Annex one refers to the annual report of the LGPS, Local Pension Board, for 2019-20. And one of the points that I'll make about the annual reports is there is no um, national guidance as to what should appear in the Local Pension Board annual reports. There is a requirement to have an annual report, but not nothing that actually says what must be covered in it. However, as you can imagine, over a few years, you get some consensus and you get some best practice. And as far as I'm aware, and I've done some, a fair bit of research on this in the past, the two reports of Northumberland's two annual reports uh, two local pension boards contain all of, all of the information that you would expect in such documents. So you'll see in paragraph 1.2 there, on, in appendix, uh, sorry, in annex 1, information about the membership and who attended we, each of the four meetings that were held in the year. So standard stuff, exactly the sort of thing that you would expect. It's a fairly long report and I do not intend to go through it. I think the, the two points that I would pick out, the first one is in paragraph 3.9, which is on page four of Annex 1. And at paragraph 3.9, I'm picking that paragraph out in particular because it effectively shows what the board chair thought was peculiar to the year, peculiar about that particular year. Um, and he refers in that to five areas that he would particularly pick out. One of them is the 2019 actuarial valuation of Northumberland County Council Pension Fund, which took place during 2019-20, with contributions payable with effect from 1st of April 2020. Um, and there was a process in setting the assumptions for the actuarial valuation, which was gone through and the board has no remit in terms of the investment decisions made by the pension fund panel uh, for Northumberland County Council Pension Fund, but it does have a remit and role to oversee the administration and particularly the governance of the pension fund panel, so for the, the LGPS. And therefore, the board was present at every single meeting of the pension fund panel as observers and at each of their meetings, they considered their view of whether the governance had been carried out appropriately. Um, the second point that, I, that is made in paragraph 3.9 is about the move to merger. Obviously, a massive decision made by Pension Fund Panel and Full Council to merge Northumberland County Council Pension Fund into Tinyware Pension Fund. So in other words, to do away with its existence effectively, with effect from 1st of April. 2020 and as you can imagine the board took great interest in the governance process that was uh, carried out for the the whole of that process and that wasn't just in 2019-20 it started before then other points that i think are worth mentioning which the board looked at in great detail were the measures to ensure pensions got paid 
to put it bluntly, despite COVID-19. So despite the fact that administrators had a massive change um, to the working practices at the end of 2019-20, um, pensions had to continue to be paid and put into payment. And the board spent a lot of time at its final meeting in April, that's reported here, um, questioning the administrator and ensuring that the appropriate procedures have been put in place um, so that everything could be done remotely but continue to be done without breaching the law. The other two points that are made in 3.9 are about the ongoing move into pooling of assets of Northern Lake County Council Pension Fund and cyber security and that was a particular flavour that the pensions regulator had asked pensions boards to look at uh, in the year. The remainder of the report, which I won't go through, a lot of it is then expanding on those points that have been summarised um, in 3.9 and showing that the how and that the board gained assurances, basically that reasonable approaches have been taken um, and that the, particularly one of the points that they are requested uh, to have a view on is whether there have been any breaches of the law inevitably within an um, administering a pension scheme that has a potential for some breaches of the law to take place but whether any of those breaches of the law were of what's described as material significance to the pensions regulator because the board has personal and uh, corporate liability um, for this specific personal liability um, and in accepting the appointment to the board uh, the, the board individuals must consider whether any of the breaches that they become aware of are of material significance to the regulator because they would have the responsibility to report those if they weren't already reported by the administrator. So that was all I wanted to say about the report, the annual report of the LGPS. If you turn to Annex 2, a few pages on, I'm not going to talk through, the, through this, but Annex 2, which is a fair bit of paper, is the minutes of the four meetings that were held of the local pension board for the LGPS during those year during the 2019-20 year. So the annual report that I've just talked about is a summary effectively of all of the points that were brought out uh, from the, the minutes. So there are 41 pages of that. If you turn to the end of the 41 pages of Annex 2, you should be at Annex 3. And this is the annual report of the Firefighters Pension Scheme Local Pension Board for 2019-20. So the other scheme that Northumberland administers is Firefighters Pension Scheme. So it also has a board and it also has an annual report. And again, we've got two different chairs for the, the two different boards and two different views, but there is some commonality as to what goes into each of these annual reports. So you'll see there in paragraph two, information about who attended, um, which, which meetings. There were three meetings of the local pension board for the firefighters pension scheme um, and attendance is shown there. The paragraph that I would bring to your attention for the FPS local pension board is paragraph four on page two. And this details out the progress that's been made on matters that were discussed by the board during 2019-20. Um, and just those first three bullet points are worth a mention. First one is the COVID-19 pandemic, um, lockdown measures that were put in place and Northumberland administers, sorry, Northumberland has delegated to West Yorkshire Pension Fund to, to administer the FPS on Northumberland's behalf but retains the governance of that and re retains the legal responsibility for the administration. Um, the, the doing part is done by West Yorkshire Pension Fund. And as you can imagine, when COVID-19 hit and working from home came in, in, in many cases in February, but, but certainly by, by March, the pensions regulator, the pensions ombudsman and various other 
uh, bodies that provide guidance. We're concerned to ensure that pensions continue to be paid um, and that administrators who couldn't do absolutely everything at the beginning ensured that they prioritised certain areas. And you can see within that first bullet point, there are four bullet points referred to there, which were the areas that the national guidance said the administrator must concentrate on, payment of pensions, processing of deaths, putting new retirements in, into payment, uh, with all the appropriate checking that needs to take place and minimising the risk of scams because there was a concern that there would be increased scams at this at this point as a result of, of COVID. Um, so the board, again, as you would imagine, the board spent some time at its meeting in April questioning the administrator and ensuring that they were able, the administrator was able to continue to fulfil the new legal duties that fell on Northam the County Council, but that were being carried out for them by West Yorkshire Pension Fund. So the other couple of bullet points that I'll just refer to there are the, the second one down is the implications of merger. So Northumberland County Council Pension Fund is merging with effect from, or has merged with effect from 1st of April 2020 uh, with Tyneway Pension Fund. And that has done away with the pension section within Northumberland County Council. And there was a, a borrowing of expertise uh, from the pension section for the FPS board. And therefore, certain measures have been taken, have, have had to be taken place, particularly the terms of reference have had to be tweaked um, to take out references to the pension fund panel and replace them with a, a scrutiny committee instead. Um, so that was something that the board had to consider and had to consider the implications of what was done in order to um, accommodate the merger that took place. The third bullet point that I'll refer to there, um, which you may have heard something of already, but I assure you, you will hear more of in the next couple of years, is about the um, progress for developments with regard to the McLeod Sergeant Remedy, which is coming into, this is about age discrimination, uh, was coming into the pension schemes the in 16th of July this year, government issued its consultations on how the remedies should be put in place. They are going to be administratively ludicrously complex and go on for some time. So again, as you would imagine, the board is going to be looking at that every at every meeting, looking at what the um, employer data must be provided and how the administrator will uh, accommodate that and ensure that it has its resources and so on in place. So that particular one was considered and has been considered and will continue to be. And that was really all I wanted to bring to your attention on the annual report. And what follows in Annex 4 is simply the uh, a reproduction of all of the minutes of the FPS board meetings in the year. So I have nothing further to add, just any questions. Thank you, Claire. Um, everyone will note that all the recommendations start with the word no, so that's... Um, <laughs> That should be simple. Um, but does anyone have any questions? Very comprehensive report. Any questions on pensions? Even more exciting than treasury management. <laughs> Am I missing anyone? Nobody has anything? Okay. Thank you. So thanks very much, Claire. And can I just um, ask everyone if they're happy that we note the annual report as an Annex 1, note the minutes of the four meetings, note the annual report of the five pension team, and note the minutes of three meetings of the FPS board held and the dates are stipulated. So everyone content that we note those? If you could show of hands, please. That's great. Thank you very much. Now we move to item six, which is the report of the Executive Director of Adult Social Care and Children's Services, um, Alan Hartwell. Thank you for your patience. Um, I believe you're presenting this, which is our Appendix F. Uh, yes, that's correct. Thank you very much, Chair. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. The, uh, this is the standard six monthly report for this committee. Um, it was due to come here in May um, and it covers the period 1st of October 2019 
to the 31st of March 2020. It, it features the usual updates um, on judgments from inspections of uh, adult social care settings, <coughs> children's care homes, uh, schools and, and earlier settings. It also covers the findings from more irregular inspections. Um, so the uh, ILAC inspection within children's social care, uh, ILAC stands for Inspection of Local Authority Children's Services, um, and also the progress updates on the action plans regarding the uh, JTI inspection, which happened around this time last year. JTI stands for the Joint Targeted Area Inspection, uh, and also the uh, SEND inspection that happened in October 2018 and SEND stands for Special Educational Needs and Disabilities. Uh, the report provides details on what the inspection judgments were and also the ensuing action plan arrangements as well. Chair, uh, if I can just give, uh, I guess, a couple of key headlines from the report. Um, we've seen an improvement in adult care settings uh, within children's social care in the form of the ILAC inspection. Uh, uh, colleagues will probably recall reports to the scrutiny committee uh, where uh, the Ofsted judgment for the local authority um, uh, children's services in relation to social care improved from requires improvement across the board to a judgment of good across the board when we had that inspection in January of this year. Uh, more primary schools are judged to be good or outstanding than, than was the case in the last report. Um, that's now better than the national average. Uh, and within Northumberland there is continued uh, better than national average early years provision as well. 98% uh, of settings are judged by Ofsted to be good or outstanding. I think the other key headline would be that uh, that even though we have had the, the COVID-19 lockdown, uh, satisfactory progress does continue to be made on reviewing and implementing action plans arising from those two area-wide multi-agency inspections that I mentioned before, uh, the, the, the JTI and the, and the SEND inspections, um, and uh, external scrutiny is applied to both of those action plans uh, and uh, the council is held to account with regards to the part that it plays within those. Uh, Ofsted and the Care Quality Commission inspections have been on hold since lockdown um, and uh, certainly for Ofsted they're, they're due to recommence in some form uh, with, with, within, within the autumn term. The, the detail is in the report and I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I don't think there are any uh, members from the services within children's or adult services on the call, so I can also take any, any queries back to them if need be. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that. Um, anyone have any questions? It's always um, always like to see a school in my area in one of those listed that is an adequate Berwick Academy. Is there any sort of particular, I know obviously this is outside NCC's direct control, is there any specific recommendations in the light of COVID for schools that have been struggling? Um, any particular help? Even there's even a possibility that this has provided an opportunity. So where the schools where there's cultural problems and, and bullying and so on, they might have actually had an opportunity to reboot. Uh, I think um, and I, I could certainly respond in general terms in terms of the approach that the local authority has taken. Uh, the, certainly the local authority has been very proactive um, with, with schools um, within the COVID-19 lockdown. There's been regular um, uh, there's been daily briefing updates to uh, to head teachers, um, and there's also been regular uh, meetings like this um, with, with, with with heads as well. Um, and uh, I think one of the th one of the things certainly that that uh, that is of note, um, and that we've shared with the Department for Education, has been um, about uh, an even closer integration, really, between children's social care and education services. And what of what, what a lot of that, for example, has led to. Um, is a very detailed um, pupil level risk assessment um, in terms of welfare and their ability to attend school, for example. Um, and that's led to a better understanding, again, at a pupil level, pupil level in terms of particular stresses and strains and circumstances that the, the individual learners um, experience. Um, and I think, I think I certainly think schools would say that that's been benef beneficial to them. Um, uh, I, I think it is 
certainly recognise that education attainment going forward is going to be is going to be a challenge um, with, with the length of time that, that that children and young people have been have been away from education settings, um, and and I know that there are there are concerns about about any gaps being being widened as as a result of that, um, but certainly I think that's an overview in terms of the steps that the local, local, the local authority have taken, um, and there's, there's been a lot of work done between social care colleagues and those within education to assess risk um, to try to make sure that those who we believe might be most in need of returning to an education um, are in, are encouraged and facilitated to do so. Councillor Oliver. Yeah, I just, just to add a sort of political, I suppose, with a small p dimension to it, uh, administration response, really. I, I think the Alan's absolutely right that the uh, one of the uh, the greatest impacts of, of COVID uh, could be widening the attainment gap in, in education. And it's certainly true that those most impacted will be the people that need to be actually least impacted and uh, and so that's a very serious problem all local authorities face right right across the country i think the um wayne as the portfolio lead uh, on this has always said and and i think demonstrated uh that that he's very keen um and i think the local authority as a whole does uh, engage with with all schools, not just the maintained schools. So there is a, a high level of engagement with uh, academies, and there's a you know a, a, a stronger and stronger relationship with the uh, uh, with, with with the inspectors and the and the uh, you know the the office in Darlington, um, and and I think it's and and also there's an opportunity uh, worth mentioning in terms of the north of Tyne. Um, uh, combined authority as well so the you know work is going on on an edu education challenge and and if something uh, like what was achieved in London could be achieved in in the northeast um, uh, uh, and I think particularly um, you know that could help some of the schools that are, are listed and we seem to have a, um, a particular issue in Northumberland where we have really good performing and increasingly you know in, uh, improving performing primary schools um, but that's really hard to keep going. Uh, and you mentioned cultural issues, and I think the, yeah, there is a lot of significant issues that need to be addressed. And it's it's a it's a it's a, it's going to, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a generation or or longer. Uh, but it has to be a priority. Okay. Does anyone else want to come in? No. Well, um, oh, sorry. Councillor Swithin Bank. Yeah, um, over the decades, really, it's been an interesting issue, this, where education seems connected, it, education attainment seems not just connected with the school itself, or indeed the quality of the staff, but it does seem a link across to the whole social fabric of a community and in particular poverty and earnings and it is some time ago when I was involved as leader but I had surveys done that quite shocked me and at that point I don't know what the position is now but we always had problems with with Berwick and what came out was average earnings per week in Berwick were half what they were in Morbeth it was literally 50% of the earning levels. And some of the issues with Ashington and the demise of the mining industry and lower wage levels, it certainly was a part of this. It wasn't just about the teaching or indeed the necessary sort of aspirations of families or their children. It did seem connected. You could read across that where you had problems, you tend to see it in terms of earning levels. I haven't seen that sort of survey done in recent years, but certainly way back, I found it absolutely fascinating because I was often, back in those days, often up to Berwick and having a chat with the head about <coughs> some of these issues. But I think to fully understand what's going on in Northumberland, you have to take a step back and look beyond education to try and understand what's happening. Anyone else want to come in on that? 
Am I missing anyone? No. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Alan, and it's um, and your team for all the work in, in this report. Um, I should add as well. Um, very sorry to hear uh, Dean Jackson's leaving us. He's another excellent officer. Um, but uh, thank you very much for that. And the members happy that we thank Alan for this report and we note the findings and the effectiveness of the scrutiny arrangements. Is everyone happy with that? Okay. You happy to move on? Yeah, thank you, Chair. So item seven, reports of the Chief Internal Audit Auditor. Um, first item, the opinion on the adequacy and effectiveness of the framework of governance, risk management and control, which is our appendix G. And do we have Kevin, Alison or a double act? Uh, yes, Chair, it's, it's, it's Kevin here. I'll take this report. Right. Great. You can... Okay, thank uh, you. Yes, hello, everybody. Um, yes, um, this uh, is the, the, the Chief Internal Auditor's annual opinion on the adequacy and effectiveness of the framework of governance, risk management and control. So the, the report um, with, with members today basically explains what we mean by the framework of governance, risk management and control, explains that the opinion for the 2019-20 year is satisfactory, which is a positive opinion for the, for the authority. Um, it explains some of the work that we've performed during 2019-20 in order to allow us to have the evidence to form that opinion. Um, which we cover in a little bit more detail in the next couple of agenda items. Um, it then provides a little bit of a summary of our conformance with the Public Sector Internal Audit Standards, with which we are obviously required to, to comply, um, as well as, as Alison mentioned a little bit earlier during the meeting, then just a little summary where we're suggesting any items for, for inclusion within the annual government statement. I think I would just draw the committee's attention to paragraphs 3.2 to 3.5, uh, which begin on page five of the appendix. So basically 3.2 just explains um, that the, the, the overall opinion on the framework of governance, risk management and control is satisfactory. And that's for the entire year from April, 2019 through to March, 2020. We do reference that obviously we do perform the internal audit service for advanced. Um, and because advanced Northumberland forms part of the wider group for the County Council, we have to mention uh, a couple of, uh, of issues regarding advance at 3.3. Um, and then at paragraph 3.5, it's just to note, obviously we are in, the, in the, the pandemic at the moment, which obviously really took effect for sort of the last few days of the 2019-20 year. We don't really need to say too much more about it. I don't think in terms of it affecting our opinion for the whole year, but it's right that we recognise that. But that would probably be more of a focus in 12 months time when we're providing our opinion on the current year, where obviously that framework has been much more impacted by the pandemic rather than the, the very end of the 2019 year. Chair, I wouldn't propose to say too much more than that, but happy to, to take any questions. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Does anyone have any questions? David, Councillor Towns. Thank you, Chair. Just on on advance, we've spent as a committee over the last three years an awful lot of time and and energy looking at various reports. And officers have spent an awful lot of uh, hours looking at what what I think what what's fair to say what went wrong with Arch in previous years and it's somewhat disappointing to see in this report that we're still caveating um, audit assessments uh, in respect of advance which is obviously the new the replacement company i'd have thought lessons a lot of lessons would have been learned and a lot of um, changes could have been implemented very quickly that would allow us to uh, give a satisfactory rating to the internal audit of advanced Northumberland as well. It, it, it is somewhat disappointing to see, uh, you know, there's weaknesses within fundamental, fundamental financial systems. Um, I'd just like some, some further explanation of what, 
what those problems identified are and, and what the council is actually doing to to address them, please. Sure. Can I pick, pick that up? Ken Sullivan. Thank you. Um, yeah, yes, um, I think the, the, the first of all, the, the advanced uh, Northumberland shareholder group meets uh, regularly, and this is always a, a topic of uh, a conversation and something that's reviewed uh, regularly. And we've seen uh, over the past, um, well, since since the, the these uh, audit concerns were raised, uh, the number that haven't been dealt with has been steadily decreasing. So there's been a, a, a very uh, uh, focused effort from the, the directors and senior managers at, at Advance to, to deal with the issues. Uh, I think what's outstanding really relates to um, a sort of fundamental systems issue to do with basically accounting systems and procurement and, and, and so on. And, and it is true that, that it's around that whole sort of end-to-end -end process from uh, beginning a pr procurement process to receiving an invoice uh, and, and signing off that invoice and then paying that invoice. That seems to be the, the main outstanding area. Uh, there is a piece of work going on in assessing different options in terms of that procurement process to, to acquire a, a new system. In the meantime, whilst that's happening, there are additional manual systems in place uh, to make sure that, that things uh, don't go wrong. So I think broadly that's the, the key outstanding area and most of the other other areas have, have, have kind of changed from amber or red to, to green. And I think that's, that's my understanding, but obviously I haven't been at the level of detail that, that Kevin will be able to advise on. Yeah, so thank you, Chair. If I can just add to that, I think to answer Councillor answer Councillor Towns' so the first part of the query, where we're talking about the <coughs> fundamental financial systems, where we interpret those to mean those core systems which will underpin any organisation. So in the, in this specific instance, we're talking about credit payment systems, the debtors and recovery systems, the payroll systems, and the rent assessment and collection systems, which are the main financial systems for the advanced group of companies where most of those transactions regarding the, the, the business of the organization are, are, are held. We, for every audit that we undertake, we issue an audit opinion. Um, there are four opinions we have in place, which are full, significant, limited, and no assurance. For those four key fundamental financial systems, one which was debt has received significant assurance the remaining three systems were limited assurance so um, councillor oliver's quite right in that uh, advance have now taken a great deal of action and reported on some action to improve that situation but we are now building into the current year to go back and revisit and test those improvements to assess whether those improvements have, have embedded and improved the systems in place. But at the time we undertook the work, it was a, a, a three limited assurance and one significant assurance. Yeah, and I think uh, broadly in terms of the individual recommendations, and there is an element of, uh, to use an earlier phrase, marking one's own homework, uh, yeah. th there were 102 recommendations, uh, 89 of them uh, are now implemented. Uh, this was a, a, a beginning of this month. Uh, Twelve uh, were currently being worked on, i.e. amber, uh, and one was uh, still red. So significant progress has been made. Chair, if I could just add to that then. So that, that, that sounds very reassuring. So thank you both, Nick and Kevin, for, for the, that further information. It sounds reassuring that we're on the right track and, and um, maybe maybe I need to recognise it maybe takes a bit more time to to resolve these issues but as long as it's heading in the right direction and we're assured that that's happening because the last thing we want to do is to go back to where we were a few years ago and I think anyone any members of the public are watching this meeting and um, now or, or watching the recording later will want to be assured that lessons have been learned and that uh, the new the new structure of advance is um, very different to its predecessor organisation. Thank you. I saw Peter topping and then Councillor Grimshaw. Peter? <coughs> uh, 
Thank you, Chair. Just very quickly, I um, like Councillor Towns. I, I noted the concerns expressed by the Chief Internal Auditor in the report, um, and I <clears throat> I hear the responses from uh, Councillor Oliver and uh, and from Kevin. But so I, I find that reassuring. But I would ask. Um, I read somewhere that there was a proposal that the that this audit committee under your chairmanship would take on some overarching responsibilities, including advance Northumberland. And I think we ought to at some point understand how that's going to work. Thank you. I um, thank you. There is and I'll ask Kevin, or if there are external auditors, if they're still on the call, if they like to chip in, but I believe there is a recommendation being looked into to be put to the committee to have an overarching audit committee. Um, Kevin, do you, do you want to come in? Chair, could I um, possibly answer that oh, one? Alison. Alison Mitchell here. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, um, the external audit and Mazar have made a really, really good um, recommendation to the authority regarding um, a concept of a parent audit committee or a group audit committee. So um, Northumberland County Council isn't unusual in that it has um, a group structure and in the accounts when audit committee receive those later in the year you'll see that there's a whole section in the accounts about consolidation and group entities and group accounts. Um, so what Mazarov said is that it would be expected and usual to have a designated audit committee to take on the role of a group audit committee or a parent audit committee for all of the entities within what's known as the County Council's accounting group boundary. Um, so we've made some um, really, really good progress with that and um, had discussions with Advance and we're working up the detail on how that would that would work. But the idea would be that one committee, probably the County Council's Audit Committee would be best placed to undertake it, would maintain a governance oversight over governance across all of the entities within the group, which are then reflected in the, in the accounts. Um, and again, Mazar have been extremely helpful in giving us some practical examples of where and how that's been implemented elsewhere, um, which we've, we've used to, to begin to pull together some proposals. So I'm sure that by the time of the next audit committee meeting, um, we'll be much further advanced with that and be able to, to bring some firm proposals back to committee for your, for your views. Great. I mean, certainly if we think going back to the point about assurance about an independence, the fact when Arch as directors made up the audit committee, <laughs> you, know, you don't need to uh, be um, an expert in governance to see that there's a problem with that. Um, never mind the actual detail of what transpired, but just that arrangement was clearly crazy to have that situation. Um, Andrew, did you want to come in at all? Or? Anyone else? Chair, it's Cameron here from Mazar. I, I haven't really oh, got Cameron. anything to add. Alison summarised that beautifully, in fact, in terms of uh, what we've been discussing over the last few months. Uh, but it is, we think, fairly commonplace uh, in uh, all sectors where you have a group, because when all said and done, Advance is consolidated entirely into the group accounts with the County Council. So um, a degree of assurance over the systems underpin those accounts and the governance arrangements would seem to us to be a sensible approach to have in place in terms of the group uh, and not out of sync with what we see, particularly in the housing sector, but also in the corporate sector as well. Chair, could I just add as well, that's that one of the options that was included in the AGS that we just discussed earlier in the agenda as well. So it's, it's one of the governance improvements to, to review for the, the coming year. Thanks, yeah, thanks, Chair. It's just on the back of what Alison said, and, and I know it's not directly related to Alison or Kevin's work, um, more of a request. Just with what you're saying there about setting up like group accounts, um, I'm, I'm going to ask here um, if we can try and follow something more aligned to 
doing the accounts in the style that we're used to in Northumberland and not in the way that they were presented to the committee that I attended yesterday, which uh, I find those accounts extremely um, confusing to follow and um, to put it bluntly, very messy. So please try and follow the Northumberland ones in what we're used to seeing here, which are more structured and easier to follow when we're doing like group accounts and the individual ones. Um, and I'm, I'm saying sort of learn by some mistakes because I'm not sure um, how you found those, yeah. Alison or Kevin, but um, they're not as easy to follow when it comes to group accounts as what we're used to here. Alison. Thank you, um, Chair. I mean, the, the accounts are pulled together by Chris and Chris's team. I think that there is a very established process within Northumberland County Council. And I think that the way that the County Council handles group accounts, there is, a, a, again, a lot of experience there. Um, but I'm sure that Chris will be glad to hear of the um, the praise which has been given by Councillor Swinburne there and I'm sure that Chris will continue with at least the standard which is which is there and potentially make more more improvements yet again but um but I'm sure Chris will be delighted to have uh, had that kind of vote of confidence on them um, North Northern County Council's <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe you could share some of that experience and information with some of the others that we have to deal with. Okay. Councillor Grimshaw had a hand up. I think she's having some technical problems. Are you there, Lynn? No. Does anyone else want to say anything? Am I missing anyone? No? Okay. Um, so the recommendations on this report are that we consider and note the Chief Internal Auditor's satisfactory opinion on the overall adequacy and effectiveness of the framework of governance, risk management and control. And secondly, this opinion is considered by the organisation when finalising the annual governance statement for this period and by the audit committee as a source of assurance at the time it considers the annual governance statement. So are we happy that we consider and note this report? We have considered it and now we're happy to note it. Yeah, just a show of hands. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin and Alison. And we move to the key outcomes from internal audit reports issued 1st of November 2019 to 1st of July 2020, which is our Appendix H. Yes, Chair. Um, this, yep. um, takes, this is the reg a regular report which, which comes to committee twice a year, um, summarising the outcomes from uh, internal audit reports which are finalised and issued to clients in that period. This period obviously covers <laughs> November to a bit of an extended um, period because of the uh, the pandemic arrangement to, to July of this year. And I think I'd just draw members' attention to the table, which uh, begins on page five of the appendix. Um, the table for each um, report, which has been formally issued during the period, just on, on each page gives a brief summary of some of the good practice that we found during the report, during the, during the audit undertaken some of the, the main issues identified and then where possible what's happened since um, and progress that's been made in terms of the recommendations that we agreed at the time of the report. I think I would just mention um, usually we um, committee will, will, will be aware that we then undertake evidence checking regarding the implementation of those recommendations and we are usually we can usually come back to the committee and give a great deal of assurance that recommendations that are stated as implemented we evidence check and find that they really are implemented this year because of the the pandemic we haven't undertaken that evidence checking with service areas um we've, we've updated everything else in the report it's just we made a decision not to be going out to service areas to be trying to do the evidence checking for those recommendations but to give the assurance to committee that it's not lost and we won't forget that we will come back to that later in the year and provide that assurance back to committee in a, in a slightly different form but you will still get that assurance from us regarding the evidence checking of the implementation of recommendations and happy to take any questions chair thank you kevin um, so we've been asked to consider the key findings um, in this report, as Kevin's outlined. Does anyone have any points or questions on this one? Am I missing anyone? No. Okay. So everyone's happy to note this report. Is that agreed? Yep. Thank you. The next item 
is the uh, strategic audit plan 2019 to 2020 final final monitoring statement which is appendix i uh, yes chair uh, exactly this is is a report which we we usually bring in may um which just outlines um, the performance of the plan for the 2019-20 year, which was agreed in March 2019. Uh, this provides an update to the committee on just what happened with that plan of work um, and against what was originally planned, against what actually happened and highlights any variances. Um, the, uh, there is a table uh, which begins on page two of the appendix. Uh, that table essentially takes the plan that was agreed for the 2019-20 year and provides a comment on what's actually happened. Um, in the vast majority of cases, we've completed the work that was planned. There are some variances where we've had work come in during the year. And as the committee would expect, we, we flex our plan accordingly and deal with any emerging issues that arise. Um, the case point, obviously, as we discussed at the last meeting of the committee, being at the very end of the year, we obviously had a, a different arrangements coming in because of the pandemic, uh, which which needed some specific internal audit resource diverted to it, or be that at the very end of the year, but is an example of where audit it would rightly divert its resource to an emerging risk area rather than stick to a plan which was was envisaged some time earlier, where some events were unforeseen. Um, as I said, the table goes through and gives an update on all the pieces of work which were originally in the plan for 2019-20. Um, and I think it was 87% of our planned days were actually achieved by the team during last year. The the, the slight shortfall just being uh, due to, uh, we had a, a member of staff who, who unfortunately was on a long-term sickness absence, which has accounted for a slight a slight drop in our performance. But other than that, Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions from the committee. Thank you, Kevin. The, I mean, obviously, strategic audit planning is going to be um, interesting and changeable. And I think what's interesting is we just, there's no end in sight for this pandemic. It's not, I sometimes look at the risk planning and think it's designed for something like if County Hall burnt down, obviously the disruption there, but there would kind of be sort of a time limit to that. We've no idea where we're going to be in two weeks. Boris Johnson's predicting it's going to be another surge. We don't know where we're going to be in two months. We don't know if we're still going to be wearing face masks in two years. Um, so I don't know if you want to comment on that, but obviously by we, we for something which is a technical discipline, we uh, there's a lot up in the air, isn't there? I, th I think all I can or re I can really say to that chair is just to agree um, and, 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 and say yeah. yes. <laughs> um, um, I can't really pass too much comment on that other than say, yes, I, I, I agree <laughs> with your comments. Um, what, we, what we've seen, uh, certainly from the, the, be the, the beginning of the pandemic, where, where the County Council was in the response phase to the pandemic, we were, received, we were quite heavily involved in the County Council's response, which again should provide a good degree of assurance to the committee that we were receiving requests for advice, for guidance, for help and, and assistance in certain changes which had to be do, kind of had to be implemented as a result of reacting to the pandemic. As the, the county is now moving towards more of a, re, uh, a recovery phase rather than a response phase, we are again equally involved in some of those overarching governance arrangements in terms of how the county council as a whole is moving towards whatever the new normal may look like whenever that new normal arises. So when we I think, come on to a future uh, agenda item a little bit later on around the plan for the current year, Chair, that goes into maybe in a little bit more detail and some of the risks that have been highlighted as part of that. But yes, in terms of some assurance to the committee uh, more widely, yes, it is a strange times that we find ourselves in. Um, and as a team, we are just reacting to that along with everyone else within the County Council and providing advice and guidance and help and support wherever we can, however we can. I mean, I have to say, I mean, apart from 
which I mentioned had concerns about the suspension of the local area councils and the um, a bit slow in the um, scrutiny committees getting back up and running. I have to say, and I've had direct experience of it, the balance between reacting while still managing risk, whether it's pay, paying business, um, helping with you know anything from community shopping, making sure we can get shopping to people to paying out which i know council oliver was heavily involved businesses getting the money to them quickly when the money hadn't actually been received by government i think the balance between reacting but still managing the risk and putting those safeguards in place was pretty spot on actually i think i was, was really impressive um anyone want to add anything steve Just watson did i see your hand up St stephen Sorry, Chair, I forgot, I forgot to unmute myself there. Um, just a quick one for, for Kevin. Um, it, it's a very good document, Kevin, and it's very thorough. Uh, I, I'm slightly concerned about information services. Um, two, of the, two of the reports that um, came up with limited assurance on them, the PCI, DSS, and network management. Um, bearing in mind that the council has so many people now working from home and probably dialing in through virtual private network arrangements, um, have, you, have you actually considered and has your IT order to consider what the risk of that is, bearing in mind the, the findings of those two limited assurance pieces of work in IT, uh, that there might be actually some higher or a higher risk than possibly we thought pre previously before these reports came out. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, Kevin, sorry, yeah, I can see Council Oliver kind of indicate, but I can certainly answer um, Stephen's question initially, if then Council Oliver would like to, to add yeah. to that. I think with those two uh, pieces of work that you referred to specifically, Stephen, were undertaken and I think considered by the committee at the November meeting where we talked about some of the issues around those two specific pieces of work. And I know that um, work has been done and recommendations implemented by information services regarding those pieces of work as, as you would expect. I think one particular piece of work which I would draw the committee's attention to is that of um, business continuity management and disaster recovery arrangements. Last year we undertook that review and we performed a follow-up in the current year or, or through the 1920 year and could see a, a huge improvement in terms of the work that was within information services regarding that specific piece of work. So in terms of having business continuity and plans specifically for information services as you quite rightly say about the, the growing demand for those type of information technology needs throughout the county and throughout the wider community that was very good to see that that those improvements had been made we then went into the, the obviously the pandemic arrangements which you quite rightly say so a different type of working which i think will will have stood the the authority in very good stead for what then happened in and is happening in real time on a on a slightly separate note we, we were at the time undertaking a, a piece of work on security, which we're in the process of finalizing at the time of the 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 uh, the, the lockdown arrangements for want of a better term and started to, to take real effect where we saw members of staff working from home and working remotely. Information services realised very quickly the need to slightly change the, ac the remote access solution for the volume of home workers. And as part of that planned perimeter security audit, we actually undertook an additional amount of testing in conjunction with information services to make sure that the new solution, which has actually seemed to have worked very well from a certainly from a user perspective, but also from an anecdotal perspective in terms of the, it seems to have helped the authority fantastically in terms of allowing the staff to work from home in the volumes that we've had to, but in making sure that all the controls were in place for that new that new piece of software that new system to work and make sure the controls were put in place as it was implemented. So I, I hope that so um, addresses your, your, your query, Stephen. Um, I don't know whether Councillor Oliver would like to, to add anything further. Yeah, just very uh, briefly, I think just going back to the previous point around the uh, business grants, I think it's worth mentioning 
both the finance team and internal audit team's role in in uh, as well as revs and bends in in terms of getting that you know 86 million pounds out to businesses uh, over seven and a half thousand businesses very quickly and we were the fourth fastest authority in the country and it was a phenomenal effort across all of those areas and one that's still going on now uh, and with the latest scheme just being launched today so it, it is you know been a huge amount of work and internal audit have, have, have played a significant part in in assessing the procedures and the systems and so on as before they go live as have it um, on the wider issue I, mean, I think two and a half thousand people were mobilized onto uh, remote working in a very short space of time uh, so that new system that was put in was you know it had to be done very quickly um and and you know it was a phenomenal achievement and i think that's one that will stand us in good stead uh for the future because you know as the, the new normal will not look like the old normal and, and more people will work regularly from home and it's important to have those resilient systems there's some work going on i have two weekly uh, bi-weekly meetings with the uh, uh the newish director of it chris thompson um, and there's some very good work going on in terms of um, uh, assessing different security threats, uh, risks and the robustness, as well as the inconnectivity of, of, of systems. Uh, there's a particular piece of work going on assessing the, the phishing risk at the moment, which is uh, uh, you know, uh, important because we've just whilst this meeting has been going on, I think all councillors have been uh, emailed with a, a warning about not uh, responding to certain emails. So it, it, it you know, it is uh, it, it, it's important. It's ongoing work. Obviously, it never stops because people are always inventing new ways to uh, uh, to hack into systems and, and cause disruption. So but but there is it is top priority. Mm. Thank you both. That's that's very reassuring. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Am I missing anyone? No. Okay. So we've um, it's recommended that we consider and note the information as set out in this report. Everyone happy with that? And thank you again, Kevin. Okay. Now the um, section D, internal audit charter, which is your appendix J. This is the report of the Acting Chief Internal Auditor um, updating the Internal Audit Charter in accordance with the requirements of the Public Set Internal Audit Standards. Kevin? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, as, as Georgina, as you've just outlined, um, we it's a, it's a requirement of the Public Sector Internal Audit Standards that we have an audit charter. Um, this The charter previously came to Audit Committee in November 2017 uh, and it was agreed at that time. It's a requirement of the, the, the standards to, to kind of obviously periodically review that charter to make sure it's still in, meeting the, the requirements etc and to periodically bring it back to audit committee for approval. Um, it's, it's quite timely at the moment to do that and bring that back to committee just to, to refresh the charter, make sure it's still up to date and meeting the standards and bring it back to committee for, for approval on a regular basis. The only real change uh, to the, the charter, which is, is before the committee today, is within paragraph 5.5, which is on page six of the uh, of the charter itself, which is the appendix. Um, this, this talks specifically about what separation of duties are in place to maintain the independence of the chief internal auditor. That paragraph has always been there um, and it, it, it previously explained that where any management control or any activity undertaken by the chief internal, the internal order that had, had occurred or was in place, that we had appropriate separation of duties in place within the team to ensure the independence. What we've done just within paragraph 5.5, I've just spelled out explicitly what those arrangements are. So the arrangements that are now specified within paragraph 5.5 have always been there. It's just that we're explaining very explicitly what those are. So if there's any piece of work where now I as the chief internal auditor would be responsible for or have undertaken, any work on that will be undertaken by the group assurance manager, led by that the group assurance manager and issued in the name of the group assurance manager just to maintain the independence of the chief internal auditor. Other than that, Chair, the, the, the charters, other than some very cosmetic changes, is as it was, and um, happy to take any questions from the committee. Thank you, Kevin. Does anyone have any questions or comments on this report? 
It's a very cosmetic change or something. No? Okay, so are we, just as for show of hands, happy to agree the updated internal audit charter? Show of hands? That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, sorry? Oh, no, that's, um, now, item A is urgent business, if any, to consider any such business that should be considered in special circumstances as a matter of urgency. I have none. Okay. Now, item number nine is a report of the Chief Internal Auditor on update and strategic audit plan. Now, I believe, Kevin, if you'd like to comment that there's information on this that would be prejudicial to the public interest. And we've been uh, recommended to uh, move into camera for this section. Is that right? Yes, Chair, that's correct. Yes. That's great. OK. Um, is everyone um, content that we move into camera for this session? We're happy with that. That's great. OK, if we can stop the YouTube recording.